Let's get peppy. This is Pep 101. Uh, now, I say Pep. This is, of course, an offshoot of the TV show Plan America that I promote way too little. Uh, it's also an offshoot of the Extra Off the Planet, which I also promote way too little. I'm trying to differentiate the three shows as much as possible, so that way if you watch the all three, it's not too repetitive. So there will be stuff I say on those other shows that I do not say on this show. So go and see them. Uh, they, they, you can see them on Facebook page, ABC Planet America, or iView, or on YouTube on the ABC News In-Depth account. That's enough promotion. Let's talk about our guest today because Dr. I'm, a, I'm sad to say that Dr. Dave is, is, not, is not well. I think he's recovered from his nose job that we talked about last, last pep. But I'm very pleased to say that we have got Mr. Bill Wyman in the house. Hello, Bill. Thank you so much for joining us. Jazz, thank you so much for having me on. It's always really a blast. And by the way, you do such a great job on the TV show um, as well. So I'm always really happy and flattered to be here. That is correct. Well done. Well done on, on knowing exactly what you're talking about, Bill. That's a great example of how Bill knows exactly what he's talking about. If you don't know who Bill Wyman is, you obviously haven't been listening to this podcast before. But for those who don't know, he's known for writing for a variety of publications. He writes for The Herald. He writes for New York Magazine. He's appeared in The Times every now and then. He's probably best known amongst his friends at home for being the former assistant managing editor of NPR, which I respect a lot because I work for public broadcasting. So he knows what he's talking about, does lots of American. And in fact, he's, he's, he's teaching the next generation, even as we speak about journalism in Sydney. So imparting his wisdom. So let's hear some of his wisdom imparted onto us today. Now, Bill, oh, by the way, you can find him at Hitsville OZ at on twitter h-i-t-s-v-i it's bill o-z yeah that's it that's the one uh i'm just before i get you to weigh in on the first topic bill i got a couple of quick updates which i like to start off the podcast with an environmental update i spent seemingly hours talking about the environment in the last podcast and uh the uh the first um update is i told you that california were going to be phasing out gas powered petrol powered cars by 2035 completely and i said that was quite a big deal an even bigger deal is when other big states join them in particular new york this week joined them to also ban all petrol uh, new petrol powered cars by 2035 matching california so this could actually this kind of reform could actually end up making more of a difference than the kind of big scale federal reforms when you add them up state by state over time. Uh, that's good news. Bad news is you remember how last week I had significant concerns about transmission lines being built. I went on and on and on about transmission lines. You might recall I said that the Inflation Reduction Act, which for all its it's, uh, for, it's basically an environmental bill, even though it's called the Inflation Reduction Act, for all its spending, hundreds of billions of dollars. I said it'd be pretty much useless if they didn't build more transmission lines because the renewable energy needed more transmission lines to be effective. Well, turns out I was too optimistic because a study has come out this week uh, from the Rapid Energy Policy Evaluation and Analysis Toolkit Project from Princeton that found if the US builds out transmission lines at the pace of the past 10 years, it would result in more coal and natural gas consumption in 2030 than if the IRA hadn't passed. That's right. If they don't increase the amount of transmission lines being built in America, it will actually, the environmental bill they just had, they just passed, will actually have a net negative effect. You might go, how can that possibly work? Well, remember Manchin put in some classic Manchin nuggets into the legislation. So, and those mansion nuggets are going to help the fossil fuel industry. So if the fossil fuel industry gets their nuggets, but there's no benefits to the, to the green energy because the transmission lines haven't been built, it'll have a net negative effect. So hopefully they'll start building transmission lines. That is for another episode. But Bill, let's get into some of the stuff you want to talk about. I know, I know you, we, we've talked a bit about the Mar-a-Lago stuff on this podcast already, but I know, I know there's been up, there's been more events occurring in the Mar-a-Lago saga this week. I know that's one that one you've been doing a bit of research on. So do you want to start us off? 
Yeah, sure. Let, I'll just do a couple of quick hits on that. Um, first thing I noticed, um, by the way, is that the final January 6th committee hearing is going to be held, I guess, October 13th in America, which I guess would be the yep. 14th year. Yep. So that should be a real humdinger. I don't know um, if, if a lot of our watchers are watching those, but I have to say they've just been extraordinary on so many levels. And um, and again, uh, watching them, you really feel like you're really watching history unfold in a really fundamental way that really, I mean, you have to go back to Watergate time where you felt like you were seeing the story unfold that are going to change things. Of course, it's a much different world in America now. And the question is, have they had that much effect? But boy, um, given a world where you have those people presenting those many, many hours of devastating personal accounts from Republicans of um, the despicable events of that day and not, you have to go with the former. So I really recommend tuning in. You can, and of course, you can catch them on YouTube afterwards. So with Mar-a-Lago, it's kind of funny because a lot of the stuff that's been going on, it's all very interesting. There's that crazy judge in Palm Beach who is uh, seemingly ruling very, very, um, a lot of people think a little bit oddly on the side of Trump, Trump and who should not probably be involved in the case at all, given that she's not the actual judge of the case. The judge made the state that okayed the warrant and all that stuff. Um, and if you recall, they were, she was going to stop the, um, um, the, the FBI from looking at a lot of the documents, which didn't make any sense. And the Justice Department was very clever, and they had a very um, narrow appeal, which, of course, immediately got smacked back down and chastising the judge. The judge is still squirming a little bit. And, and then now Trump is appealing to the Supreme Court, one of these rulings. But the big picture thing is that this is all basically a sideshow. And so much of what has gone on, like so many things in Trump world, is that they're so good at creating like these big little sort of cat fights over in the corner when the real story is sitting right in front of us. And the real story is that he was warned a million times he wasn't supposed to take these documents. After he took them, he knew he wasn't supposed to head. Everyone involved lied, dissembled. They didn't handle the documents well. They were irresponsible. And um, the criminality of it, again, just seems so, so, so obvious. And we're going to get to this point um, on this topic later on. We talk about the Oath Keepers, that, um, that we just can't get around the fact that um, the factual basis of the warrant and what a lot of people think will be an actual indictment are just so obvious. And every day there's more dribs and drabs of, of things that people knew even before they left the White House that this wasn't right. And then um, a final new twist today is that, um, um, what was it, one of the, um, uh, oh, forgive me now, one of, but one of the other lawyers now is saying that they knew, you know, that, that Trump was telling them not to say that um, they had the documents, something like that. So anyway, it's <laughs> okay. squirming. You just feel like he's on a fish hook and he's squirming <laughs> and it doesn't obviate the fact that um, he's on the fish hook. So, that, so I think that all the legal minutiae should be understood that this is a small, this is a ruling by a separate judge on a small matter that was appealed on a small matter that he is now appealing, but it really doesn't have anything to do with the real case going on. Oh, and I'm sorry. And the, and the other thing that came out today is that the archives is saying, look at, there's still more documents we haven't gotten back yet. So it's actually wow. before that, that comes back to what I've been saying all along during this, which is if I was the Department of Justice, after I'd conducted that raid of Mar-a-Lago, and got all those documents out, the very first thing I'm doing is applying to a judge for a raid of, of Trump New Tower. Jersey. Of which? Trump Tower. Oh yeah, or, 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 or the, the place in New Jersey, yeah. Yeah, yeah, just, just, yeah. just other places that Trump hangs around because he clearly just stashes documents all over the place. So yeah, I would have thought- and, and that's actually such a good question because mm -hmm. generally the Justice Department doesn't screw around with those sorts of things, you know, mm -hmm. they don't, you know, if you kind of have a, uh, a a house in the suburb and an off and a um, a small apartment in the city, they don't have any problem with going after both of them. And there's a lot of speculation that it was a um, a source inside Mar-a-Lago that was testifying, and it could be that um, they just don't have anyone that says that anything mm -hmm. like that was going on at the Golf Car um, Club in New Jersey, mm -hmm. and that on balance they just felt like they didn't have enough probable cause to go to a ju judge to get that there because. Um, just based on everything we know about Trump, why would there be these things at Mar-a-Lago and not New Jersey? Yeah, yeah. Um, just, just to 
tie up with a little bow what you were just talking about with the appeal um since that's the story of the week apart from what you just added today which i didn't know about so <laughs> that's really interesting um with the appeal i just want to just clarify what the appeal is actually about because you are I, I completely agree with you it's of no significance at all in fact it could not be a more trivial grounds for appeal in that in that they they're not appealing but just just, just a little reminder what the appeals court slapped down was that that the original judge said that uh, the the special master, the guy looking over the documents, um, was supposed to look over the classified documents as well, and that the Department of Justice weren't allowed to investigate Trump using those documents. They were like investigate them, but not using those documents until the special master was finished. Uh, and the appeals court said, no, 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 the special master shouldn't even be looking at the classified documents and the Department of Justice can investigate however much they want using those documents. Now, what Trump's appealing is not the bit about the Department of Justice investigating him with the with the documents, which is all, the only thing the Department of Justice care about. They don't care what the special master looks at. They just want the documents to be able to investigate Trump with. And Trump is not appealing that. He's only appealing that the he, he is he is arguing that the appeals court did not have the authority to stop the special master looking at classified documents that's what the grounds of the appeal are to the supreme court so now that's going to clarence thomas who will decide whether that goes to the full court or whether it gets slapped down whether now i know since i said clarence thomas i i, I could feel i could hear bill and i could feel every well listeners going oh yeah here we go it doesn't actually matter what Clarence Thomas finds, because the grounds of appeal are so narrow, no one cares about the outcome, which makes you wonder why are they bothering to go through that process? And I actually don't have an answer to that. I've seen some cynical legal analysis uh, analysts online um, suggesting that this is the kind of thing that lawyers do when their client says do something and they just don't know what to do. So they just file a nothing appeal just so they can hopefully get a verdict that says that up, upholds their, that appeal and then they can and then their client can say, oh, look, the Supreme Court supported me, even though it did nothing of any consequence whatsoever. That's that's some speculation. We just don't know. What we know is that the appeal literally is irrelevant to anything that is happening as far as the investigation goes, which is the only thing anyone cares about. So I just want to yeah. just make that clear. And it's, been, and it's been fun to watch it because um, we do all have suspicions about particularly Trump appointed judges these days and with good reason the Supreme Court even. But um, it is very refreshing to sort of see these people um, go into court and come up against these really, really obvious questions that everyone's been talking about, such as that, but if they're, they're the government's, you, you have no claim to these documents because they're the government's documents, you know, it's just, it's just sort of an odd thing to be going through these legal maneuvers to get these documents or, or even asked to exert some control over it when you don't have what, you know, what's called standing yeah. because you have no interest in them because they're not your documents, which, yeah. um, is, is very fun to watch. Uh, do you have anything else to say about Mar-a-Lago before I know, I know. Okay. Be, and it is one of those really, really, really great cases. And it's a great Trump thing where he's doing outrageous things. Then he's doing something 10 times outrageous, then 10 times outrageous. And just when you think he's in the cook for all these things, he comes up with something that is 100 times both more outrageous and more obviously criminal. Well, talking about mysterious uh, legal moves from Team Trump, uh, this week also saw him suing CNN for $475 million for defamation. Uh, the claims were all over the place. Um, the, the, the main one seemed to be he objected to them referring very, very regularly to his claims about the election as the big lie. Yeah, CNN loved that term, the big lie. And look, and I, I must say, I've, I've always found that, found that a little a little tabloid, the whole big lie thing, but the uh, like just calling it that over and over and over again, it doesn't feel like a news network to me, but it's certainly not defamatory. If you don't want people to call you to say you've had a big lie, then don't lie in a big way, which is what Trump has done for the last, the last two years about the election. He says that the big lie is meant to be evocative of Hitler, which it probably is, but that's still not defamation to a public figure. They're not calling him Hitler. They're just they're just evoking the concept of the big lie. 
Um, this person who regularly uses phrases like enemy of the people, yeah. which was used by Stalin. Totally, totally, absolutely. And look, I mean, look, I don't think anyone's taking his defamation lawsuit too, too, too seriously. I mean, this is the very, it was like literally the, the day after this, this lawsuit came out the day after he tweeted out, where is it? I've got it here. So not, he, not he tweeted out, he truthed out on Truth Social. He truthed out, uh, let's see. Is McConnell approving all of these trillions of dollars worth of Democrat sponsored bills without even the slightest bit of negotiation because he hates Donald J. Trump and he knows I am strongly opposed to them? Or is he doing it because he believes in the fake and highly destructive Green New Deal and is willing to take the country down with him? In any event, either reason is unacceptable. He has a death wish, must immediately seek help and advice from his China loving wife, Coco Chow. I look, I, there are so, I could spend half an hour breaking down that tweet for all the inaccuracies and, and all the defamatory elements. It's just like no one's taking Trump seriously on def- defamation. But once again, it raises the question, why is he bothering to do it? Because he's not going to win that case. Now, this one, I, yeah, go, Bill. Can I mention just two things? One, yeah, and go. let's also forget the utter vulgarity and it, and not even just the racist element of it, because you know McConnell's wife is a is I guess she's Asian. I, don't, I guess she's Chinese. she's Taiwanese. She's not even Chinese. She's Taiwanese. She does not love China. <laughs> no, exactly. And so it is you know blatant racism. And let's remember that this was his transportation secretary. Yes. Okay, so he yes. about his one of his own cabinet secretaries who quit on July on excuse me not that right after January six number yeah. one. Number two, but who has completely gone to ground about it and doesn't even come out and talk about it, which is disgraceful. Mm. And, um, you know, so we should, I mean, it's, it's completely called for what he said, but let's remember this is a really awful person along with McConnell. And of course, McConnell puts up with all this stuff um, and the vulgarity. And then of course, this stuff about the death wish for McConnell, like mm. what is he trying to get himself killed, wink, wink, you know? Mm. Well, no one rid me of this uh, um, Senate minority leader. Um, <laughs> yes. in for a second, because, the, you know, you really made a really good point that, you know, we do reflexively um, defend uh, the media for things like this, but it really is true that, that CNN has really been operating in a very problematic way for a really long time now. And, uh, you know, to this day, people are still saying, oh my God, Jeff Sucker left, Jeff Sucker left. But, um, you know, he is a guy who maneuvered the Trump era for the network's benefit very cleverly, right? But it came at an extraordinary cost, you know, elevating bozos like Don Lemon, um uh chris uh what's his Cuomo. face yeah cuomo yeah, yeah. um who are just really 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 embarrassing mm-hmm. silly people to have on a news network mm-hmm. along with everything else and he coddled all these big stars and um and, it, and i really think it lost its way and so of course the suit is ridiculous but it's also true that cnn has just been operating on a very uh um an unfortunate way for what now six years so. yeah yeah I, I feel like the descent of cnn is one of the most depressing aspects of the trump years like cnn went from in about 20 about 2014 2015 went from a normal standard news network to within 18 months it just became propaganda which was very depressing to me to watch because yeah, it also yeah. it, it actually validated a lot of trump's crit- critiques of cnn which originally were unfair yeah, I totally agree. And just yeah. the elevation of those people. And even, um, you know, Jake Tapper, I think, is a serious guy, obviously, yeah, and, you know, does a good job. But, um, and, you know, Anderson Cooper is kind of on the edge. And then basically mm-hmm. everyone else has become really. Um, and, and I think that's an unfortunate thing for both CNN and MSNBC, because mm-hmm. um, it's, well, Fox is, of course, literally 100 times worse than either mm-hmm. of them put together. Mm-hmm. There still are these really um, scabby, um, not scab at things that that you really um can pick at like a scab that is wrong with them that really undercuts everything mm. yeah but uh yeah but nevertheless i mean i'm glad you said that but uh yeah nevertheless this this lawsuit isn't going anyway <laughs> that much is that much is clear i should also say by the way on that tw- on that truth i read before i didn't want to go into all the reasons it's untrue because i just found it self-evidently ridiculous but those trillions of dollars of bills he's talking about he was actually complaining about mitch mcconnell keeping the government open it wasn't a trillion dollar bill it was a it was a couple of billion dollars and it was to keep the government open to stop a shutdown that's what he was talking about he wanted Mitch McConnell to shut the government down which by the way would have been disaster for the Republicans on the verge of the uh, midterms as well but so we're being politically stupid 
and it would have been just terrible for the country as well. It's just it's just such a it's just ridiculous. Anyway, and like I was saying, it's you, you you ask yourself why he would be doing this, and apart from just the PR value. I, th- I think we I think we might have seen at least some of the answer uh, the, the within 24 hours when he put out a an email uh, begging for money for his lawsuit saying uh, I am suing the corrupt news network CNN for defaming and slandering my name remember when they come after me they're really coming after you and then asking for money and um, I just want to put this in context this this, this cash grab because Trump already has over a hundred million dollars on hand in his Save America pack already, right? Which is more than the eighty million dollars that the D- that the DNC and the RNC, the Republicans and Democrats, have combined, right? Going into the midterms, um, Trump has more than either of them, and so far in this general election, he has spent a grand total of nine hundred thousand dollars on supporting Republicans out of that hundred million dollar. <laughs> That's Ooh, a, right, yeah, yeah, bank account he's got. It's, the, uh, it's, a very, it's a very, very cynical world. And and for a little bit, um, I don't really want to go into it, but I actually, through a word chain of circumstance, I was actually working for someone who was kind of in that world, though mm-hmm. a little bit apart from it. And it was really interesting to watch her too, because you could just see, you know, her and her husband just sort of turn the knob up when they mm-hmm. needed a little bit more money and the way they did it, the utter cynicism of it and the sort of confidence they had that they knew how to bring in a little bit of money um, well, or in their you know ca- their case a lot of money in the case yeah. of trump's case, an enormous amount of money yeah. um by by um uh shaking down that that part of the electorate absolutely well it it, it that didn't end with the save america pack even though it's at a hundred million dollars over a hundred million dollars oh by the way even though he spent less than a million dollars on republican candidates he spent four million dollars just in August on his personal legal fees out of that super PAC, I might add. Um, and then a month ago, his allies formed MAGA Inc., which was another super PAC, which was, quote, uh, com- committed to saving America, making America great again, and it will ensure that that is achieved at the ballot box in November and beyond. So far, it hasn't spent one cent on any Republican candidates. Uh mm-hmm. And they're not replying to journos who ask about it either. Sorry, was that Bill? Well, it just, I mean, you know, what's worse? I mean, you know, them, you know, raising the money under ridiculous pretenses, getting more money out of these poor gullible people and using it to influence an election or doing the exact same thing and actually not spending it on the election. And uh, Yeah, yeah. Well, this is actually quite relevant to what we're going to be talking about pretty soon, which is we're going to go through the Senate races and some of those candidates really need some money. And some of them are Trump endorsed candidates who really need some money. And they would be looking at Trump starting his third cash grab and directly competing with them for fundraising. And yeah, no doubt he, Trump is going to raise a lot more than they will. He's much better at it than they are. And uh, yeah, it's, it is a, it's a strange state of affairs. Let's just put it that way. Um, should we get on to the hurricane? Because that's that's one of the biggest stories of the last couple of weeks. We haven't talked much yeah, about that. Ahead. Yeah, I yeah. don't have all that much to say about it, except for the usual um, uh, um, hypocrisies you see in American life when it comes to these, particularly in red states, that they all come running to the federal government for help. Yeah. Um, one thing that in um, Australia you might not know, but that that um, the way you know the American system works, all these states pay money to the government and then it comes back and there's an accounting of what they call the giver states and the taker states yep. and, and so there's um and obviously long story short a lot of the red states are the poorest states in america and also the least populated states and they of course get two three sometimes four dollars back in federal money for every dollar they actually put in whereas a lot of the big blue states um california new jersey new york and such like that obviously put a lot more money into the federal government than what they get back. Mm. Um, but of course, it's the people from the red states who complain the most about government spending and and uh, pork barrel stuff and like that. Um, though, of course, there are some exceptions, of course, like Texas, for example, it's a very rich state and Florida. Yeah. Um, so we do have another thing where you, do, you have these people who are climate change deniers and who are on the side of these insurance companies, which rig their policies so as not to be able to help people and they get the inevitable floods and things like that. Um, so that's the setting for what's happening now. Yeah. 
Well, I was just going to say on the hypocrisy thing, there's actually, Ron DeSantis has been accused of much more direct hypocrisy than just general red state hypocrisy because he was in Congress uh, in 2012 when Hurricane Sandy ran through New Jersey and uh, he did not vote for the $9.7 billion aid package for Hurricane Sandy on the grounds that it was not f fiscally responsible. Uh, he, the, the quote was, Congress should not authorize billions in new borrowing without offsetting expenditures in other areas. This put it on the credit card mentality is part of the reason we find ourselves in nearly $17 trillion of debt. So, uh, so people have accused him of a, a fair degree of hypocrisy that he is now only too happy to take the aid from the federal government now that he's the governor of Florida and they have a hurricane. Do you have any thoughts about that? And there always is sleaziness whenever there comes to government spending, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, these, these big events, and particularly in these key states, disrupt the economy in all sorts of ways. And it's a smart investment of the federal government to get, you know, people rectified and yeah. get transit lines going, electrical backup, gas flowing again um, in all of these cases. And so it's actually, um, you know, there's a really strong case to be made to just get this stuff done and get the economy going so there's not long, longer lingering. Um, sorts of um, effects. And the other reason it's important to have um, good insurance policies in place and um, rectification of insurance companies after there is a disaster is that you don't want 10,000 families all of a sudden thrown into bankruptcy, the poor house, homelessness, kids aren't getting educated, kids are dropping out of college, things like that, people losing their jobs. Um, and and again, a lot of times, of course, you're dealing with people who are poor, who are getting the worst of it all, and throwing them um, down a, um, a um, you know, a, uh, um, a, a very, it put them into a really bad place. And of course, yeah. it's better for everyone if that doesn't happen. So it's a smart investment of federal money. But of course, that's not the issue of these things. It's just playing to the cheap seats. Absolutely. I, I should say, by the way, that uh, I actually think, I think that, re that Rob DeSantis has been hypocritical, but not for the reasons I just said then. I was just, I was just paraphrasing the argument that other people have made. Um, I think there is a clear distinction between the Hurricane Sandy funding and what Florida is getting at the moment from FEMA. And that is that the Hurricane Sandy, Sandy um, bill was debt financed. It wasn't, it wasn't part of the appropriations. It was on top of appropriations. Whereas what the FEMA is paying Florida at the moment is coming out of appropriations it's already been budgeted for now i i i obviously myself would vote for the, the hurricane sandy <laughs> relief bill but just but they are actually different if you want to ping him for hypocrisy i would suggest you don't ping him for hurricane sandy i would suggest you ping him for 2017 when he was also in uh contra in, in uh in congress and uh and there, there was 36 b so actually he wasn't in congress then he, he the uh but the uh uh, and he, I, sorry, sorry, let me get this straight. He was in Congress in 2017. I'm getting confused with something else. That was when Hurricane Harvey, Irma and Maria affected the Florida region and the entire South. And there was a $36 billion bill, which was indeed debt financed and not appropriated for. And he voted for that. So it went once it affected his region. So there's the hypocrisy right there. <laughs> I know it's been, it's been trivial, been nitpicky, but I just wanted to just point it out. No, you're very good on the facts. You have <laughs> <Thank you>. information. <laughs> um, let's, talk about, let's talk about people giving out fentanyl in bags to kids at Halloween, okay? <laughs> I'm not sure there's a lot of facts behind that one, Bill. <laughs> um, yeah, but, uh, I, I just wanted to talk about a couple of quick things with the hurricane before we moved on because we haven't talked much about this. The first of one is, is this is one of the rare times I'm going to repeat myself a little bit on from what I said in the extra off the planet last week, because I want everyone to hear this because this really, really gets my goat. And that is, um, I'm going to play, I'm, I'm going to just tell you an abridged version. I went to quite some detail on the extra. Uh, Kamala Harris, who everyone who's listened to this podcast knows I'm not a fan of, um, has been pinged quite extensively in the last week for something which I think is incredibly unfair. And I just want to defend her like I defend her in the extra. It was because of this grab that got sent around. I'll just play to you now. It is our 
um, lowest income communities and our communities of color that are most impacted by these extreme conditions and, and impacted by, by issues that are not of their own making. And, and so women. we... Absolutely. And so we have to address this in a way that is about giving resources based on equity, understanding that we, we fight for equality, but we also need to fight for equity, understanding not everyone starts out at the same place. And if we want people to be in an equal place, sometimes we have to take into account those disparities um, and, and do that work. Now that was sold as Kamala Harris saying that hurricane relief had to be dispensed according to race because of equity reasons. That's how the original grab was captioned. Uh, you never heard her say that in the grab. And so I immediately went to find the original context because I thought, oh yeah, here we go. And sure enough, she wasn't talking about the hurricane relief. The, she was very clearly talking about climate change in general, addressing climate change and communities that are poor communities that are most affected by climate change and need the most right. help to try and deal with it and to, and to uh, try and mitigate against it and so forth. Um, and when you actually hear that, now the actual grab itself, unfortunately it goes for about four minutes and it's incredibly painful and she, and she argues it in a, in a, in a stultifying manner. Um, it, it actually, if you actually listen to the full grab, it explains exactly why she should never be president because she's just not very good at this. But the Democrats, but can I say, and the yeah. Democrats are all this way because they can say they can, I mean, I'm not, I'm a complete idiot and I can phrase it better. I can say, look at, there are people out there who take it on the chin every single day from the time they were born and their kids have been taking it. And you know what's happening right now? They're getting it again. And we have to understand there's people with less advantage from us. They're the ones who need our help. And God damn it, we're going to be there for them every day. Joe and I, we're going to be there for you. That's all she has to say. That's saying the exact same thing. And she yeah. doesn't put it that way. She's this, um, this parsing of the words equity and equal. And you're just going, what in the hell are you talking about? Look, I, I completely agree about the competence of it. But just leaving it aside and the effectiveness is rhetoric. But just leaving that aside for a second, as a politician in the 21st century, you need to know you'll be taken out of context. Like that's just going to happen. And so you need to not say it and that all the time. You need to not, not the, and, and politicians do this relentlessly. They like, and Kamala Harris does it heaps, heaps. And so does Joe Biden, where they allow themselves to be clipped out in a really easy way. Now you might go, hang on, they're not robots. They're just talking like people. Look at someone like Pete Buttigieg. Pete Buttigieg never does that never you could not chop him up even if you tried like he, he makes sure he always puts the the specific noun in the sentence that he's talking about he's never vague he's always precise and as a politician in in the 2020s you just need to do that otherwise because the fact is the sad thing is i am the only person who bothered to find the context of that grab i have seen i saw on meet the press the fema administrator being given that exact grab, taken out of context in the exact way, clearly ripped off Twitter. And then the FEMA administrator not knowing how to deal with it because she hadn't been warned about this. They, they hadn't briefed her. And I, I've got the quote from her. This is how she responded to that grab, that you, the exact grab you just heard. Our program support everybody. I would say I believe some of the things the vice president was talking about are the long term recovery and rebuilding these communities to be able to withstand disasters so they can have less impact. We're going to support all communities. I commit, committed that to the governor. I commit to you right here. The all Floridians are going to be able to get the help that is available to them through our programs. Just say she was talking about climate change. <laughs> like it's just and that's it's, such a great example of how meet the press gets excuse my French, goes up its own ass too with these yeah. political gotcha things instead yeah. of talking about the serious um, um, the serious matters underneath it. So, yeah. yeah. I, but the, yeah, the other thing I want to raise about that, though, which I didn't mention on Off the Planet, if you want to see the full defense, by the way, you can just go see Off the Planet. I have the full grab there, which goes, as I said, for four minutes. Um, and that's part of the problem. Fact-checking it takes so long because you need to play the full context. When sometimes these answers go for go for ages, and it only takes a second to play the out of context grab. It takes ages to play the proper grab, so that, that doesn't look like it's chopped up, right? Um, but the other thing I noticed is someone in the Democrats presumably knows, presumably Kamala Harris knows she's been taken out of context, yet no one's running defenses for her. 
And I think that's noteworthy. I think it's noteworthy that Democrats are not running a defense for Kamala Harris. I like it. It, it makes me wonder whether, whether maybe Biden's team is, is I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go all the way saying undermining her in her bid to be the next president, but possibly they're not working as hard as they can to try and support her. Because yeah, it's a little it, scary what's going to happen after the midterms. And we could talk about this right after the midterms about mm. what's going to happen on the Democratic side. And if mm. Biden decides not to run, it's really going to be unpleasant because um, she, you know, obviously being a black woman, she's going to mm. come under a lot of unfairness. And I totally agree with you. I don't think she's a, she was I think she was a terrible candidate. Mm. I think she's been an iffy spokesperson. She's been a you know, she's had a thankless job. Yeah. Um, but when you do see people like you've got a jig out there talking. Um, you you forget for just a minute his complete um, lack of um, uh, um, experience mm. <laughs> for president, mm. um, and you think, wow, this is the kind of communicator we need. So it might be a really unpleasant two years. Yeah, I know uh, Biden runs again. Actually, I mean, I think that things could straighten out by then. And if he does get too old, he could resign or something. But boy, I, I just really worry if he if he decides not to run, it could really be unpleasant on the Democratic side. Look, we, we will talk about this, I promise, Bill, after the after the uh, election, before we wrap up for the year, because I am interested in your thoughts on where we're going from here, but we should probably see the results before we decide, before we go on about it. I mean, my, I, I will just tell you right now, I'm not optimistic for the Democrats over the next two years. <laughs> the, I think that there's a, probably a recession coming, and I think that the, that the Republicans are probably going to win the House, and I think that we're going to see... Uh, endless impeachments, and I forgot, I've got a stats nugget about that coming up. I'll, I'll, I'll save my I'll save my fire um, <laughs> for that. But um, I do want to just say one thing about the hurricane. One other thing about the hurricane before we move on, which is I want to talk about flood insurance, which is not a sexy topic, but you know I, I tend to monopolize these not very sexy topics. <laughs> but, but I think it's a big topic, even though it's not sexy. Um, and let, let me just 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 take you through. Firstly. Just general insurance in Florida has got its own problems. Even before we talk about flood insurance, home insurance generally in the entire Southeast makes a massive loss because they've got so many natural disasters, just one after another, after another. Um, and there's massive payouts after all these hurricanes. Uh, there have been two huge payouts just in the last few years. Home insurance in Florida is literally the most expensive in the whole of America. Like it's the most expensive state in America for home insurance. The average insurance rate in Florida for home insurance is $4,231 a year, which is triple the US average of 1500 bucks. Yeah, that's uh, a lot, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so obviously fewer people get insured for that reason, and especially the poor aren't gonna get insured. About 12 home insurance firms in Florida have become insolvent in the last two years, when all those people who are clients of those insurance companies are now uninsured. Like they, they're just screwed. So more than 400,000 people have lost their insurance from these companies. Uh, just in the last year, actually, 400,000 people in Florida have lost their home insurance. Anyway, so they've got this death spiral going where they try and deny claims because they're not making much money and there's constantly natural disasters. And it just so happens that, um, well, like, so you basically after every hurricane, about 30% or so of the claims are denied. Like 30% of the claims are denied from Hurricane Irma, 40% uh, of the claims are denied for Hurricane Matthew. Uh, it's it's yeah, this is what I was making reference to before, that you have mm. this incredible financial incentive of these huge companies to screw mm. people over mm. and also have politicians so that they're not held accountable for that sort of nonsense. Totally. And of course, the natural tendency for people when they get screwed over by insurance companies is to sue them because this is America. And so as a result of this, according to Florida's Office of Insurance Regulation, 76% of all homeowners lawsuits nationwide in 2021 were from Florida. <laughs> so, it's, so it's the home of the lawsuit for insurance companies as well, because they have, they, apparently they have quite uh, generous laws for, for lawsuits uh, in regards to insurance in Florida for, for whatever reason. Um, so if any of those are class action suits, Number one, and number two, let's also remember that as a whole, poor and the disadvantaged don't have the same access to the legal system. So there's probably an enormous number of people who don't even take the course in it. 
Of course, absolutely. So anyway, so you can see there's a bit of recipe for a death spiral there with the Florida insurance industry, where obviously while this happens, they're going to get stingier and, that, and less people will get insurance or get more expensive and so forth. That is even before Ian. Okay, enter Ian. Uh, lots of estimates at the moment of damage. Low ball is probably $40 billion worth of insurance damage. High ball, I've, I've seen some estimates at $60 billion of damage. Katrina was $65 billion. So that gives you an idea of the ballpark we're talking about there. Um, $60 billion adjusted for inflation would make it the 12th costliest American disaster since 1980. Um, and I've only been talking about home insurance until now, but it actually gets much worse because remember what this is about is about flood insurance. Just, and it, and it, it just turns out in the end that law insurance policies in Florida have to, hur have to cover hurricane wind damage, but not flood damage. Right. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's that's a perfect example. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So people think they're covered, but they're not covered because it's the flood damage that actually causes all the financial damage. Uh, the hurricane wind damage, they'll cover your roof, but the rest of your house is covered by the flood damage. All right. And uh, yeah. And well, one thing I've noticed in Australia is that mold isn't such a big issue here. Mold is very prevalent here. Mm. And in America, it's a it's one of those tipping points. And so yeah. what causes a lot of problems in the house is that you get flooded and it ruins your carpets and everything. But then there's this mold mitigation that you go through. And that means they pull off all the sheetrock of your walls and bring in about 30 fans and then blow the fans at a high decibel volume for three days to dry everything out. Because every if you don't do that, You'll get, you know, you'll get this black mold, which will eventually, um, you can't sell the house with it, you know, renders the house basically inhabitable. So oh, okay. um, that's why all that is so costly and so important in America. Well, so given what Bill just said, you can understand the problem with the fact that basically zero people are covered for flood damage from private home insurance, even though some of them think they are, but they're not. The government has stepped in America to try to deal with this. They offer a national flood flood insurance program. Uh, it's about a thousand dollars a year on top of the four thousand dollars that Florida people are paying paying for their home insurance. So once again, for rich people rather than for poor people, um, it's not unlimited coverage anyway. That thousand dollars per year of flood insurance it covers up to two hundred fifty thousand dollars worth of damage, which yeah, that's a that's a fair amount, but There'll be plenty of places which aren't fully covered by that. Wait, um, no, in Florida, wait and, and seriously though, in Florida though, um, that is enough to pay for a house. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a little, and traditionally it is. It might be a little low right now, but for two hundred fifty thousand dollars in Florida, you can get a house. Sure. Okay. Well, it, it, I'm just 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 yeah. just making sure people realize it's not it's not unlimited, but still, it's a, we're talking a thousand dollars on top of on top of um, your home insurance. Uh, even that, by the way, sorry. But I think that's fair. I mean, the other thing that happens with these Sunbelt states and the, the states that have the, that are cheaper, basically, you know, they all make fun of the expensive states. They say, oh, you wouldn't believe how expensive it is to live in New Jersey or New York or Washington, D.C. or San Francisco and stuff like this. Well, that's because people there tend to pay more for the um, for, you know, for their amenities. And, you know, it's one of the things you want to live in Florida. Well, you're living in a hurricane prevalent place and you have to pay for insurance. So I don't find that much of an issue. Sure, sure, sure. Um, well, as it turns out, not everyone does pay for their flood insurance. Quite, quite a few people don't. Uh, about 18% of Floridians have flood insurance. So that's second in America to Louisiana, uh, which has the most. Uh, 4% nationally have flood insurance, although yeah, obviously in other areas, they probably don't need it as much as they need it in Florida. Um, basically, so we're so basically talking eighty percent of Florida has no insurance for floods, effectively. Okay, uh, in the Ian affected areas, there were nine counties declared disaster areas. One point eight million households in there. Twenty nine percent of them had flood insurance. Okay, so one point three million households had no flood insurance in the disaster affected areas of Ian. Obviously, the poorest areas don't have much. Hardy County, which is a super poor county had a 1.3% coverage rate right, the, in the disaster area. Uh, okay, what about everyone else? 
Well, that people who aren't covered. Well, FEMA offers limited emergency assistance, which is like temporary housing in a motel or a mobile home while you're while you're out of your house, uh, making basic repairs to make our house habitable. It's capped at seventy two thousand dollars, but usually it's less than ten thousand dollars they'll give you. Right? So most people end up way out of pocket from the FEMA emergency money. Uh, it's uh, some people might use charity they might take out a loan whatever i mean they're on their own apart from fema essentially um so unless there's you know, some extra bill sometimes if it's a big disaster there'll be some extra bill sometimes uh a lot of people get screwed essentially and the thing the is silver, um, one quick thing the only silver lining there then is probably a lot of those people are renters and yep. then so the people who are taking the real brunt of it are the the people who are owning the apartments and stuff like that but boy, you know, if you're a rent, if you're a renter in Florida, particularly not in Florida, you're living marginally day to day in any case. And about the only bright spot is that, well, you're not losing your home. You're just losing all your kids' possessions and stuff like that. And you have to move. But of course, the housing stock is going to be more valuable then. It's going to cost you a lot more um, to move. And of course, you're going to have lost some of your possessions. I should say that as well, though, that there's a bit of a perverse situation here because you don't want to screw over the poor who are the people who are going to be most affected by this scenario I'm talking about. And, you, and yeah, as a human being, you want the government to help those people out, the people who, who just got completely screwed and aren't getting enough from FEMA and their lives are ruined. Uh, but on the other hand, if you just give them yeah, just all the money they need to rebuild and they rebuild in exactly the same place. It's going to happen again in two or three yeah. years time. Like this is the nature of climate change that these people shouldn't be living where they are. And, and the ideal world for both America and just, just for people is, is that they shouldn't live in areas which are going to be, be constant disaster zones over the next few decades. But if you don't, if you give them, if you don't punish them, they won't move. And so there needs to be there needs to be some way of creating a program where you can make people better, but somehow encourage them to move because it's not helping anyone if they rebuild in exactly the same place. There is some um there have been studies that show that there are some people that have gone through this iteration a few times, but mm -hmm. honestly, just just my under I don't want to say I'm an expert on this, but I would be seriously um surprised if this was actually a big issue as you're describing it just because um places like florida aren't in the business of bringing people back to whole you know what i mean they're they're what you said the first time just throwing a little bit of money at them and then you're on your own yeah there might be some places where that sort of moral hazard thing has has kicked into gear somehow or other i'm not sure how but, but um or no that won't happen yeah, yeah, you're just saying the punishment is happening, whether we like it or not. I've got you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, okay. All right, let's. Uh, that, that's enough of that. I, I was going to, uh, I was going to end this section with a with a bit of a laugh, but I, I uh, actually, now why not? Here we are. Just, to, just for the people at home, enjoy this clip. Uh, the uh, Bill, this, this is, um, this is a, a, the Senate candidate for Delaware in 2020 republican senate candidate for delaware she's the second person you're going to hear and the first person was a person in 2020 the congressional challenger of nancy pelosi explaining what really went on with the flood we understand that the deep state they have weather manipulation technology they have darpa they know how to manipulate and create big storms hurricanes tornadoes climate change etc and these huge hurricanes always seem to target red states, red districts, and always at a convenient time, typically right before elections, uh, or you know, in this case, possibly because Ron DeSantis has been stepping out of line a lot and challenging fighting the deep state. I don't know, Lauren, the timing is definitely interesting and they're even saying it. Do you think this could be a weather manipulated Hurricane? I mean, I know that Florida is uh, prone to hurricanes. However, this developed into a cat four oh, or cat five overnight. Right. And it does seem to be hitting uh, the uh, the conservative areas of the right. state. Um, you know, you and I don't I, 
I, I'm not putting it past the elites uh, to target something like this towards Florida as punishment uh, for uh, getting rid of vaccine mandates or getting rid of child grooming. They are angry with us, and it wouldn't surprise me to find out. And yeah, the technology does exist, um, but you're not supposed to talk about that or know about that because that's controversial or a conspiracy theory. No, it's true. Okay, so that's, a, that, that's enough about floods. Let's talk about the flood of tears from Elon Musk, who's who's been forced to buy Twitter <laughs> against his will just because he signed so, the contract. Tell us about this story. Yeah, it's such an interesting story because he's such a strange guy. And um, there's so many interesting kind of fun things happening. And at the same time, he is so rich that um, he can get away with so many things, okay? <laughs> but so as you guys know, he he was shooting his mouth off. He he bought nine or 10% of Twitter, and then he said he wasn't gonna buy it. And then all of a sudden he decided he was, and then he made, it, he made a huge offer for it. And the Twitter board looked around and said, you wanna pay how much for it? And he said this much, and they all sat around and they said, and, and people really, I, I'm being a little bit flipped, but this is really what happened. And everyone said, look, this guy is a notorious flipper to give it. And I don't know if I can say this, a notable douchebag. And so we really have to protect ourselves. Okay. And so they really wrote up a contract that says, hey, you're buying Twitter. You know what you're buying. Like there's no outs and stuff like this in any way, shape, or form, essentially. And so then, of course, he being at Elon Musk, X amount of months go by and he says, oh, he wants to get out of it. So they go to, they, they um, get a trial. Um, set up. And I don't know if you guys have talked about this before, but no. American companies tend to be um, incorporated in the state of Delaware. Have you talked about this? No, we haven't. Okay, yeah. So Delaware has incredibly um, um, pro-business incorporation um, things, and they don't charge a lot of taxes, right? So all these companies, like the Walt Disney Company is incorporated in Delaware and stuff like this. So Twitter is incorporated in Delaware. And so what's happened over the years, there's a thing called the Delaware Chancery Court that handles all these mega, 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 big, huge um, behemoth Godzilla versus Mothra fights, okay? <laughs> so all of a sudden, this huge thing between the richest man in the world and this fat, fabled social media company is getting adjudicated in the, state, the tiny state of Delaware, okay? And now the, the, the downside of that from Elon Musk's point of view is that they don't mess around in Delaware. Like they have enormous contribution. You know, if you have like IBM, I don't know if IBM is still based there, but when you have these multi-billion, sometimes trillion dollar corporations incorporated there, when there are contractual matters that come into play, they don't mess around. And so when, um, once this started happening, you know, I, again, I can't, I'm not a lawyer. I can't claim to be a big business expert, but, but like the Bloomberg people who are the smartest people in the world about this, what they're basically saying is, you know, this is a contract that says he's going to buy Twitter for $44 billion. Mm -hmm. And there is this little clause that people keep talking about it, that there's a billion dollar payout, but for complicated reasons, that's really not applicable. And it's a contract. He signed it. And the Delaware Chancery Court can say, I don't care if you don't want to buy it. And then people say, but how can you force him to, to manage Twitter? It's like, you can't force him to manage him, but you can force him to pay him $44 billion. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just, and so it, you know, it was practically unanimous that people said that he didn't quite know what he was getting into. Mm -hmm. And so that's why all of a sudden he's come around and said, okay, now I will buy Twitter for $44 billion right on the eve of going to trial. So, and now there's some new things coming out, stuff like that. But um, just briefly, I just want to sketch out a couple of things that could mm -hmm. happen. It's super interesting because um, he, he has these two contradictory things about Twitter. One, he says it's barring too much speech and he's a free speech absolutist and blah, 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 blah. And at the same time, he says he wants to cut down on the trolls. Okay, so the thing about the trolls is that we all think they should be cut down, but it makes Twitter money. Of the major social media companies, Twitter is the most poorly managed and it's the, the company that makes the least amount of money and that it's worth the least amount of money. When you consider what a big name it is, it's worth a fraction of places like, like Facebook, right? Mm. Um, and so he wants to do, so what he's gonna find if he does end up buying Twitter, which it looks like he's gonna have to now, um, he's gonna find that cutting down the trolls is gonna reduce Twitter's income. And he's also gonna find that if he opens up the floodgates to all these hate speech and people like Donald Trump, stuff like that, he's gonna be damaging the Twitter brand. And the reason Twitter has been clamping down on those people not because it's a free speech issue, but because it's a behavioral issue and it's a violation of the site's explicitly stated terms of service. And if he wants to go in and remove all those, that's fine, but he's gonna turn it into even more of a toxic wasteland 
than it is already right now. And a lot of people keep participating in it, even though it is. So there's a kind of interesting ways where no matter what he does, he can be damaging Twitter's brand even more. He is buying Twitter, but he's also getting an enormous amount of funding from people. And those people are going to be leaning on him to not have his investment of $44 billion go down to $20 billion, which could seriously happen. And it's happened to major social media companies in the past. So, um, and then you also have the net effects if he's associating himself as owner of Twitter with hate speech, racism, insurrections, um, and all this other hateful stuff that goes on there, that could end up damaging the brand of Tesla as well, which it actually should. Um, final thing I'd like to point out that um, we all know about how Liz Cheney lost her reelection bid in Wyoming um, because she's gone up against Trump and stuff like that. Um, the person who replaced her, I forget her name, is a crazy person and is one of the really, really um, low quality candidates the Republicans have found themselves um, nominating across the country. Mm -hmm. And she's probably going to win election as a representative because Wyoming is a very, very red state. Yeah. But Elon Musk was at her victory party the night she um, she defeated Liz Cheney. So that's the type of person we're talking about. And so it's going to be really fun to watch. And I think everyone should get the popcorn. <laughs> yes. I think her name's Harriet Hagathorn or something like that. It's just off the top of my head. I don't remember exactly. Something like that. There are these unbelievable yeah. video postings from her just saying yeah. complete you think it's not that hard to say, oh, you know, Liz Cheney put up a good fight, but I'm gonna be someone who's gonna be fighting for Wyoming and American values. Instead, she was talking about all these crazy conspiracy theories and looking yeah. like a deranged person as well. <laughs> sure. Um, all I'd add to that is uh it's not just the trial that's coming up, but what was actually coming up this week was Elon Musk being deposed. And I feel like that's not a coincidence that he decided to uh, to to actually go through with it, or at least to commit to going through with it directly before he was about to be deposed by the opposing counsel. Uh, yeah, and in very, fact, very difficult. It's a very difficult thing. Like what Twitter should do. It's just a. It's just. It's just been one of those companies that. Um, it's. It kind of reminds me that that if you go way, way, way back, remember the Beatles and all these. Mm you know, rock bands in the 60s, the Beatles and the Stones, somehow they gelled and they defended themselves up against the outside. And then there were bands like the Kinks and the Who that, that just fought on the internal, you know, and just always ended up being much less successful. Pratt Falls being much more artistically. And we all look at all these things from the outside and think, oh, it's like, you know, it's like the monkeys or the Beatles all living in the same townhouse, but it really isn't that way. And um, for better or worse, Facebook had this guy Zuckerberg who really did a really good job for better or worse, mm -hmm. keeping his control and making it profitable. And then you have places like Twitter that have always been a basket case. No one's ever had a clear way to make money off of it. And um, and I just know as a sometime user myself, just the, the user experience is terrible. The ads are terrible. The interfaces are terrible. They do inexplicable things. And, um, and I, I think it's right on the edge of just sort of getting that tipping point of being considered to be kind of an icky place rather than a positive place. Well, I was also going to say that they can't, one of the problems Twitter has as far as profitability and, and the balancing act that you're describing is they can't afford to lose many users because they really don't have many, at least by social media standards. Like I don't think people realize because they, because Twitter punches above its weight in the media, like all the journalists are on are on Twitter and, yeah, and like me. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, yeah. I don't think, I don't think people realize how poorly Twitter does amongst everyone else. Like I've got some numbers here. These are from Wikipedia admittedly, but still, yeah, Richard Cook will tell you Wikipedia is good. Um, <laughs> it's, um, uh, Twitter's got 396 million monthly active users worldwide. Facebook, which you compared it to has 2.9 billion monthly active users worldwide. Instagram has 1.2 billion monthly active users worldwide. TikTok has 732 million monthly active users worldwide. Snapchat has 528 million. Twitter is just ahead of Quora. Quora has 300 million monthly active users. Quora is irrelevant to anything. And so like, they can't afford to either burn off the, the nuisance 10% of their viewers uh, of their users, or alternatively, uh, allow them to run riot and piss off the other uh, uh, about half their users who will then go away. They can't afford to do that because they already don't have very many monthly active users. So they've got a problem. 
And, and the other thing, on top of everything else, they're bad at sort of the PR game. And so when they do things like take off Trump and all that stuff, their their whole um, messaging of it is incredibly incom incompetent. And they, they've completely lost the PR bottle, particularly with the right. And they're just is this thing. It's just taken for granted now on the right that Twitter censors people on the right or that it's hostile to the right, which is completely not true. It's just, you, you know, as someone I've been on social media since the beginning. And, I, you know, and you look at what happened in America, you had the rise of Trump. And you know all this terrible stuff happening just directly um, that that certainly you'd think would not have happened if all these views were being um, censored. Okay, and the, and when they do take people off, it's because of very clear reasons and after many warnings. And Trump, of course, violated the terms of service for years before he got he before he eventually got kicked off. Number one. Number two. The most bail flu baleful and I use the word loosely, or use the word in a, in a colloquial way, censoring media operation in America is Fox News, okay, mm -hmm. which censors people, distorts the truth, produces lies, doesn't produce corrections, and has a, um, has a fierce partisan slant, okay? And somehow or other, Twitter is seen as the one that's supposedly censoring people when, of course, it's Fox every day. Like, and just to give you one example that we're going to talk about later when we get to the Senate, Herschel Walker, I actually did a deep dive the last couple of days and tried to search through foxnews.com, which is an enormous news website, yeah. to find out if they've ever given a full accounting of a Herschel Walker's business scandals, okay, yeah. which on top of personal scandals. And I don't want to say it's not there, but I could not find it. And what they do is Fox will say, oh, yes, we've covered that. But it'll mention, you know, um, Herschel, you know, way down the stairs, say Walker's also come under attack for business um, issues that his detractors say show that he is not up to, you know, they kind of written it a very oratun backward way. And they don't actually say, oh, he lied about this, lied about this, lied about this, owes money on this, et cetera, et cetera. So that's just one microcosm, an example of how Fox News censors information away, which Twitter simply doesn't, it, with except a very, very few examples, very few examples. Yeah, look, I, I, all, all I'd say to that is that like Twitter as a platform is supposed to be a bit more, I think, uh, open to, like it's supposed to be a platform which is generated by the people, whereas Fox News is not. So you'd expect, you expect Fox News to be a little bit more discerning about what it puts on as a news network than a social media platform. A website does that allows everyone to comment on everything like so i mean so i'm not sure it's comparing apples with apples there but i do take your point about the different degrees of censorship like that's certainly a valid point yeah and i'm just yeah. talking that they lost the pr battle about it, that yeah that yeah. Um, you know just in my reading and listening to podcasts you have people talking about this and it's just a surprising amount of people talk about we'll just refer to twitter um doing this sort of thing when it, it just seems to me it's just demonstrably not true except for a bunch of high profile examples yeah 99.9 .9 which would justify we deserve given lots of fair warning and um are to people who are just being total jerks i mean 90 percent of what happens to people on twitter it's not for anything they say it's because they're being complete jerks fair enough i will let that be the last word on that topic let's move on to oh stats nugget stats nugget stats nugget Woo! This one comes to you directly from the EPI, which is a lefty think tank, but they know how to count, so their numbers are accurate. <laughs> but, uh, this is a real interesting one. From 1978 to 2021, realized CEO compensation increased in those, what's that, 43 years by 1,460% adjusted for inflation they're the key words adjusted for inflation so i can't imagine what they are not adjusted for inflation now you might think to yourself hang on stop they're just reflecting the stock market the stock market's gone up a heap as well not that much it hasn't over the same period the dow jones rose by 842 percent adjusted for inflation and the s p 500 rose 904 percent adjusted for inflation so the ceo pay rose significantly more than that over the same period the incomes for the top 0.1 percent 
of Americans. And we're talking people with over $3 million a year income now. They've grown after inflation by 385%. Okay, so just for inflation, the top 0.1% have grown 385%, but CEOs have grown 1,460%. So CEOs get paid nearly seven times as much as the top 0.1% on average, and their pay is rising at a rate that's nearly four times as fast as the top 0.1% one percent so that's pretty rarefied air for the ceos in america i thought that was an interesting little uh, nugget which i thought i'd bring in that's a story we've been seeing iterations of now for decades yeah that's yeah. the reagan era yeah, yeah. so i mean that, it's not you know from their point of view it's not a bug it's a feature i am uh well certainly featuring uh quite uh, effectively <laughs> according to those numbers um let's uh i'm i'm as always with you bill we always we always rail on together for a while yeah, and so we always we, we never cover the topics we mean to so i'm so gonna, gonna I'm, go ahead. Is that? are we gonna talk about the senate well we we are going to the, uh, the, the, the i know you want to talk about the biden marijuana thing so do you want to work that in quickly oh just really quickly yeah. um, biden um pardoned everyone in federal prison who was serving time for simple possession of marijuana and not quote unquote dealing, which is, again, this is something that should have happened 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, there's not that many federal prisoners. No. Um, I don't even actually even know the number, but I, I do. Six not- and a half thousand. Okay. Yeah. So, which is not much in the size of America. But, yeah. you know, he also was taking an effort to encourage governors to do the same. Mm. And he's finally directing the DEA to deschedule marijuana. It's a what's called a Schedule One drug, which makes yeah. it about heroin, which is just ridiculous. There is <laughs> one of the big mysteries in America because Obama, for example, was a natural person who should have done this. There was a lot of speculation that Hillary Clinton was going to do this had she been elected to succeed him. But um, oh, the the president is the executive over the DEA. I mean, the, the president can order the descheduling of it, and it's always been a mystery why. He didn't do it, and I don't know if they were worried about his re-election or something like that, but it's something that the president can literally do. Mm-hmm. And um, and I don't know if it's sort of, you know, I don't mean to sound so um, uh, hyperbolic, but um, fascistic ev- elements in the DEA or something like this, or just people who are just telling him, look, at, if you do that, it's going to unleash the Kraken against you on your re-election, and it's going to cost us senator of the house i really don't know why i mean the the legalization of marijuana is doing great states are making a ton of money about it it obviously has obviously health benefits and things like that so we'll see what happens but it's an important step yeah i i can look i i can't speak to as to why they haven't politically made the step that you just described before but i can tell you at least from a bureaucratic reason why the why marijuana hasn't been taken off schedule one through the normal process. I can't tell you why the president hasn't come over the top, which I think they should have a long time ago, but through the normal process, it was unlikely to be descheduled anytime soon because what puts it on schedule one, which as you say, is along there with heroin and LSD and ecstasy. <laughs> the, um, what puts it on schedule one is that is not that, oh, it's so hardcore, it's on schedule one. It's that it has no medicinal value. If it has a medicinal value, it goes on to Schedule 2. Oh, right. Yeah, right. No, which, but that's the thing. I mean, which yeah. is just ludicrous, right? Yeah, because no, it I know. Like, exactly. Just, yeah. Yeah, like, we're, we're, as soon as, soon as you say that, it. yeah, as soon as you say that, people go, hang on, we know it does have medicinal value. People do use marijuana for medicinal reasons. That's all over the place. Well, part of the problem is that you need to prove it in a way that is acceptable by the federal regulators. But the problem is... Because it's on a schedule, it's on schedule one, it's hard to do that because you can't actually get quantities of marijuana for the purposes of experimentation that will be recognized by them because it's on schedule one. So you need to go through this extremely lengthy process to even conduct an experiment that they will approve of. And so it's a very circular situation where if you're on circular. And and I'll tell you, there's actually an interesting thing. There's actually. Um, I might not have this right, but I, if I understand this correctly, there's there's actually one place in Mississippi where the government is allowed to grow marijuana. Okay, <laughs> uh, things. Okay, 
Yeah. That's how sensitive it is. So for decades, it's been there. But of course, marijuana is a very, cannabis is a very complicated plant and there's all sorts of different strains of it and things like this. And so they've only been dealing with one particular strain that they had at this one place. And you get to ridiculous things in recent years where um, I know someone who wrote a story who worked at the University of Washington and part of their job in whatever department of biochemistry department is they were dealing with cannabis that thing. And it was all under lock and key and they had to sign out you know, through two locked doors and two people, the things they were going to use and stuff like this. And he's sitting in his office and he could look out onto the street of Seattle and see cannabis stores, right? Yeah. But he's in this building <laughs> that's federal funding that has to do that kind of stuff. And I don't know if you know this about me, but um, through a very weird chance of circumstances, I was editor of hightimes.com for a while. I did not and, know that. Yeah, and I don't even drink. I don't <laughs> drug. But it, it had a very failing website, and I do some website consulting. <laughs> so I was trying to get them, uh, you know, back on their feet because obviously this is a very valuable brand in America, and it was in a bad position. So, and one of the funny things is that editing there, people bring these stories in, and um, and I was working on a whole bunch of different things. But one of the things, just as an editor, I'd say, well, that's not true, and then you start talking and you find out it's completely true. So for example, um, the fact that no one's ever died from marijuana in America. Mm. And then people say, well, that can't be true. And it's true. Like, mm. it's just incredibly difficult to die from marijuana. Mm. And at least as of a few years ago, there's no attested, there was no federal governmental case, which obviously has an impetus to come up with that, of people dying from marijuana. But basically all you can do with marijuana is get very high and then it wears off. So all sorts of things like that about it. And of course, the medicinal value of it is almost miraculous in some cases. So mm. let's really hope that this is a, uh, um, this is a move. And this is something Australia should really do too. It's just ridiculous. It's a, it could be a huge uh, tax uh, uh, maker for tax money maker for Australia. And particularly if New Zealand, um, you know, you don't want New Zealand to just take all the, uh, to get out. <laughs> That's it. Nationalism going. That will work. Um, I, I just going to say is one more thing about this, which is you might ask, who cares whether it's on Schedule One? What's the what? What? Why does that make a difference? It's legal in California and a bunch of states. Why does Schedule One make any difference? The reason it makes a difference is because banks are unwilling to finance people, the companies that that uh, are dispensing a product which is legal on a state level, but is Schedule One on a federal level. And so it actually affects the financing of a lot of these companies. So once it comes, moves off schedule one, the industry will grow considerably. Yeah, it's it, no, and I should have mentioned this, that it's actually been very, very difficult because literally under Trump, there was concerns that anytime they wanted to, Sessions could have sent people to California and just shut down a whole bunch of cannabis dispensaries yeah. and literally arrest people yeah. and shut down the banks that were funding them. I mean, the federal government, there was some concern, particularly the first year of the Trump administration, that they might do that just to be complete jerks about the whole thing yeah, but for yeah. okay let's let, let let's talk 2020 now Alan, and we want to like bill foreshadowed we want to focus on going through doing around the grounds and some of these senate races because we, we we talked about them months ago and haven't really talked about them much since and a lot's happened since then so let me just uh just before we start going through race by race i do just do a bit of an overview just very quickly uh biden's approval at the moment 42 percent at this, that's going to Gallup. Uh, at this point in time, Trump was at 40%. Obama was at 45% in 2010. That didn't work out too well for him. Clinton was at 42% and got smashed in 94. Reagan was at 42% and got smashed in 1982. So 42% is not a great place to be. Uh, morning, according to Morning Consult, I talked about this on the show, but I'll just bring it to you guys because I think it's an important point. According to Morning Consult, 59% uh, Democratic voters said that Biden should run for re-election in 2024. That's not a great number. You you would like you would like the Democrats to be more enthused about their head of state at that point in time. Uh, at, uh, I should say, and that was up from 53% in August. So that was sold as a positive story for Biden. But in that same poll, the exact same poll, I noticed that 28% of people Democrats, 20% Democrats said he should definitely run for president in 2024. So that's really not a great sign for where Democrats are with the Biden administration at the moment. Only 28% were saying he should definitely run in 2024. As far as the generic ballot goes, which is just Republicans versus Democrats in the House, 538 has the averages at the moment of Democrats 45.3 versus Republicans 44.3. 
so at one point leaves it's very narrow considering that the way the geographic layout goes democrats usually need to be ahead by a bit in order to win the house uh according to nate cohen you might th you might have thought i should have said, mentioned gerrymandering then as well which is the intentional drawing of boundaries to disadvantage one side according to nate cohen there isn't much gerrymandering at least effective gerrymandering this election he says that according to him there's only uh nate, nate cohen is a bit of a is a new york times as election analyst uh according to him the republicans only have a three-seat advantage this election from gerrymandering which i was quite surprised by um, that's the smallest advantage in 30 years, for whatever reason. Um, and he also reckons it's a real, his projections are it's a real, real close one, because he second reckons in the 29 districts where there have been polls since August 1, the Democrats are running an average 3.9 points behind where President Biden was in those, in those districts, and Biden won by four and a half points. So we're looking at basically a tied national vote at this point in time, which isn't good. For Democrats, because they need to be a little bit ahead because the natural geographic advantages of Republicans. So you, you want to jump in there, Bill? Yeah, I think that's all super, super interesting. And the cool dynamic of this election that I think is so interesting is that a new president almost always gets hammered at the first midterm period. That's just, you know, the new president comes in and, gets, and particularly yeah. when you control both sets of house, uh, both houses of Congress, they actually do stuff and there's some sort of a backlash. We saw very, very, very severe ones. Um, recently, and the only really recent exception was um, uh, um, the anomalous uh, one after 2001, mm. um, when you had Bush still still um, riding high in approval after um, the 9/11 attacks. Mm. So, so that is the thing that, and and you have a president who does not have a great approval rating, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the only thing ameliorating it is that um, two things: one. Um, the Republicans have been supporting the violent insurrection overthrow of a Democratic election, okay, which that's something. And then two, things like the Dobbs decision, and actually some other things too, where there's a feeling in the country that the Republicans are still doing all these outrageous things. And so in a way, you don't really have the thing like, oh, geez, the Democrats are doing all this stuff, because a lot of people are going, the Democrats aren't doing anything. The Republicans are trying to overthrow the elections and they just took away abortion, for example, and things like that. So there's a sense in which there is a sort of right wing uh, um, um, dominance in the country right now that there might be some reaction against. Okay, I, I think and it's I think, I think it's true to say that the most significant policy victory in the last six months, possibly in the last two years, was Dobbs for the opposition, not for the government. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and it yeah. creates this weird feeling like, mm. well, if the Democrats are in control of everything, how the hell did abortion just get mm. a lot? Yeah. Okay. And um, and it's really funny because one of the things I was trying to do is delve down and find out what the um, because everyone says, oh, this is going to alienate women. And there's been a lot of um, um, some really good empirical evidence that women are allegedly um, um, registering to vote. And there's mm. been a couple of very unusual um, electoral results like the. Um, like the initiative in Kansas, yeah. that which is a very conservative state, that um, where you saw where you saw pro, I don't want to say pro-abortion, but pro-choice mm. forces won by an enormous margin, even mm. in a state like Kansas. Mm. And then, um, and one of the things I'm interested in is once in a while you hear pollsters say one thing that doesn't get talked about is that young men also support abortion. Okay, overall, more men than women are opposed to abortion. OK, but I think what the argument is, though, again, I couldn't find any polls that reflect this. But I what I think I've been hearing people say is that actually young men are much more supportive of abortion than older men who are probably overwhelmingly opposed to abortion. And which, it, you know, is kind of a logical thing, I think, in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that's going to be a very, very, very hidden thing that we haven't quite seen yet, whether that's still in people's minds and if they're reacting to that. And also, we it's just really hard to tell these days because of all the social media ads and stuff like this. And you assume that people on the left are targeting those issues really, really severely on social media ads, targeted ads saying, hey, look, you don't want to be supporting um, this anti-abortion craze. Those do you really need to support this and that campaign. Oh, that is certainly the case. The Democrats are definitely hitting the abortion advertising as hard and promotion as hard as possible it's definitely their key issue we talked about this on uh the on planet america last week in this in some depth um essentially there are 
if you look at the polls, all the polls, uh, Democrats are trusted on abortion and climate change. Republicans are trusted on the economy and uh, crime. And Republicans are, tr are trying to make everything about crime or inflation. And Democrats are trying to make everything about, in particular, abortion. There is no doubt about that. And I posited on the show that the winner of that of the argument, what is the preeminent issue of this election is probably going to win the House because they're both going so hard on that. And so to that end, I just want to just to, to show you a poll from Monmouth this week, which Democrats would not be happy about, which is um, because the Republicans have been getting a little bit of momentum in overall polling in the last couple of couple of weeks. And I think this is why uh, these were very important issues, according to people in Monmouth. Inflation, 82% of people. Crime, 72% of people. Elections and voting, which is presumably a Democrat issue, 70% of people. Jobs, unemployment, 68%. Immigration, 67%. Infrastructure, 57%. Abortion, 56%. Racial inequality, 53%. Gun control, 51%. Climate change, 49%. So... Wait, yeah. did you mention immigration? Was that one of them? Yeah, immigration was 67%. Okay, it was there. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, so so you know, immigration, strangely, actually splits 50-50. Like when you look at the trust, like there are people who you think that that would be a Republican issue because they go on about it a lot, but actually there's a lot of people who are supporting Democrats as well who, who are upset about immigration and the way it is. But there's in, they think... They, they think that they, they, they approach it from the left and think that it's unfair to the immigrants. So, so that doesn't actually cut either way. But crime in particular and, and inflation cuts to Republicans in a big way and abortion and climate change cut to the Democrats in a big way. You can see the Democrat issues were way, way down that list and the Republican issues were at the top of that list, which would be, which would be comforting to Republicans. And, and if you follow through, when asked which group of issues is more important in their support for Congress, concerns about the economy and cost of living, 54%, big concerns about fundamental rights and democratic processes, 38%. Republicans, <laughs> Republicans prioritize the economy, 71%. Democrats prioritize the rights, 67%. But independents were with Republicans. 61% of independents went with the economy, economic issues, 29% with the rights and democracy issues. Yeah. So that, and if I can yeah, point yeah, out again, yeah. that the um, that the Democrats are so bad at messaging, because one thing I think I've said this from the beginning is that why when Biden got into office, he didn't immediately say, listen, folks, we got a huge deficit that Donald Trump brought you. We got a huge headache coming from um, um, the, 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 the spread of the COVID epidemic, which is much more severe. And Donald Trump brought you that. We're going to be seeing inflation. Donald Trump got you that. Inflation is not something that happens overnight. I'm going to be working really hard, but be prepared. We're going to deal with all the stuff, the, the hangover that Trump left us. So like, that sort of messaging, I think, would have really helped him through this. But instead, they um, they went, they're doing stuff and, and arguably even did stuff that made inflation worse mm. um, by, by perhaps spending a little bit too much. But this is all something that could have been signaled, I think, and they didn't do a very good job on. Yeah. And the only other poll I'd say before we do the around the grounds is relevant to what you just talked about, which was how much is abortion leaking away as an issue and how much is it not? According to Ipsos, shortly after the Supreme Court's ruling, 29% of rep reproductive aged women, 18 to 44, said that abortion was one of the top three issues facing the country. In September, that'd become 12%. Ooh. So. So yeah, so it went from twenty nine percent to twelve percent. So now, I don't that I'm not saying that that, that that they necessarily won't still vote on abortion. I'm just saying that that that's what the polling suggests at this point in time. And, and I, I don't know because um, it, you know advertising and everything is so um, targeted these days that but you just have to hope that the Democrats are doing a good job in associating Republicans with that. Now on the other hand, you have to admit this was the most. Um, the biggest Supreme Court decision since Bush v. Gore, and it's something that that really affects an enormous lives of enormous amount of people. And um, you know, we really might that that, that all this stuff. You're, this is just one way I'm thinking. I think this is the way I think we should think about the midterms. As I said at the beginning, that all these things are just you know, when you have this new president, 
We know he's he or she is going to get spanked in the first midterms. Mm -hmm. The fact that there's inflation <laughs> that makes things even worse. Yeah. The fact that the um, his approval rating is as low as he was. All those things are the makings of a really bad midterms, and we're not actually seeing that. And so that, to me, is the issue, just about how bad is it actually going to be. It certainly could have been a lot worse, and what sort of um, lingering effects are the Dobbs decisions and, and you know the January 6 hearings and stuff like that. Um, I assume there's going to be some sort of report coming out at some point, um, and then there's always a chance for an October surprise one way or the other. Absolutely. So. Things, things change, things change fast. Let's do the around the grounds. Let's start with Wisconsin. Wisconsin is uh, uh, Barnes versus Ron Johnson. Uh, in terms of funding, in the third quarter, Mandela Barnes raised $20 million. Ron Johnson, we don't know yet. The 538 projection is Ron Johnson by three points at the moment. Do you have any thoughts about Wisconsin? Well, just that he's always really been ahead. He's a really, it's, it, some of these states, you just, they, they've really been changing. You know, Wisconsin was kind of more of a, a swing state, and it's just really hard to see from the outside how someone as severely um, pro-Trump, an election denier, he's really, really bad on the, on the COVID-19 mm -hmm. and he's anti-abortion why this happens, but incumbents really do have a lot of advantage, a lot of this. And I don't know if she ever seemed like she was going to be um, a serious challenger. Now, on the other hand, he is an incumbent Republican senator and being even that um, little ahead, I think is kind of a bad sign, but I don't see how he gets thrown out of office. Unless yeah, look, I have to agree. I think Ron Johnson is starting to pull away. Mandela Barnes actually was ahead of Ron Johnson a few weeks back and Ron Johnson has pulled ahead. I don't think it's a coincidence that Ron Johnson has pulled ahead of Mandela Barnes when his crime ad campaign started to kick up a gear. Uh, that basically the super PACs have been just dumping money in Wisconsin uh, on, on a crime campaign because uh, Mandela Barnes has a bit of a vulnerability in that respect. He's the, um, he's the deputy deputy, there's a lieutenant governor, and uh, he, um, he's he got uh, two vulnerabilities when it comes to crime. One is he's a longtime advocate of removing cash bail, which is on the nose a little bit at the moment in America because New York has kind of hashed up their cash, their cash bail removal law. I mean, there are plenty of states, not plenty, there's a few states out there that don't have cash bail and there's no problems, but New York kind of buggered it up. And for that reason, it's on the nose a little bit at the moment. And they're, they're hanging that around Mandela Barnes's neck. Uh, that the second thing is he was a lukewarm advocate of defund the police two years ago when it was cool for Democrats to do that. And he he very soon regretted that and changed his mind. And now he's all, oh, let's fund the police. Let's fund the police. But they've still got the grabs from two years ago. And they're on repeat over and over and over and over again. So um, that is yep. a, that's and a big have, issue. And I have said this before, like it, it just, I think one of the first times I was in your show, there's that, there's that line that echoes through American politics. I belong to no organized political party. I'm a Democrat. You know, <laughs> yes, that's yes. Line. You know the fact that, that how the Democrats could lose this issue is, um, and, you know, because I went back and looked and I, to find Joe Biden articulating his position on the, the violent protests and stuff like this. And I think literally one time in a debate, he, he tried to articulate something really smart that virtually 85% of the people in America would agree with, um, which is that, you know, most police are good. We want to train the police better. And um, we're all on the same side of this issue. Nobody thinks that there should be violence against the police and blah, blah, blah. But Trump shouted all over him. So yeah. the fact that they lost that, that was a great opportunity for him to um, distinguish himself. And so they left themselves wide open. Yeah. And Mandela Barnes appears to be paying the price right now. And this, and at least in Wisconsin is a crime election. One of the things you're about to find out as we go through these states is every state has different issues, which is which kind of makes it interesting. Let's go to Arizona, which has definitely got different issues. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. You, there because people were always talking about how this Mark Kelly race, mm -hmm. um, who's the incumbent senator, was was going to be a um, a race up that that might be close, and I just never ever thought about that. You know, Mark Kelly is an astronaut. He's a Democrat, but he's a moderate Democrat, and he was married to Gabrielle Giffords, who was a state representative. Excuse me, a federal representative um, from the southern part of the state, from Tucson, and she's the one who nearly got uh, assassinated 
I, you know, by Loeffner about, I guess, eight or 10 years ago. And she's become a big anti-gun advocate. And Kelly has too, but he's a great guy. He's, he's an astronaut. And I never thought he was going to um, be vulnerable. And of course, they nominated a complete bozo against him, <laughs> Masters, who's funded by Peter Thiel. And he's just going down. So that's kind of, it's been fun to watch them waste all that money in Arizona. But I never thought, you know, a state that elected um, Kirsten Cinema a couple of years ago, there's no way is not going to reelect Mark, uh, Mark Kelly. Yeah, Mark Kelly is a very, very careful politician as well. He doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't make, he, there's no Mandela Barnes style, style clips from Mark Kelly that you can play on an attack ad. He's, in fact, Mark Kelly, even though his wife, as you say, was nearly assassinated a, a decade ago by by an assault rifle. He's barely said anything as a politician about the guns issue because he's incredibly careful. He's so careful. <laughs> it's just that, like you're just not going to get him on anything. Um, and, Blake, sorry? In all fairness, in all fairness, I think that um, you know, and he, he's been a big advocate for that with Gabriel Giffords. That I've seen, I've literally seen them together at big anti-gun events and things like that. But even in Arizona, which is not, um, which again you have to remember is an honorary deep South state. Um, and it's a very, very, very dumb state. But even in Arizona, they're not going to hold that sort of thing against you when your wife, you know, <laughs> had head blown off yeah, um, yeah. By, by a shooter. So um, uh, I, I don't think he's vulnerable on that level. I, I, I should say the 538 projection is Kelly by five and a half points. And that is blowing out. Like over time, that's becoming that's becoming a bigger, a bigger projection. Um, What's a big issue in Arizona is abortion. Abortion is a big, and, the, and there's no surprise Kelly's doing well because abortion is a big issue in Arizona. And the reason for that is because Arizona has an 1864 law in place at the moment, banning abortions with no rape or incest exception. There's only a life of the mother exception. This 1864 law is so ancient and so ridiculous that as part of the same batch of laws that was passed as this abortion law, there was a law that declared, quote, no black or mulatto or Indian, Mongolian or Asiatic shall be permitted to testify in court against any white person. That is part of the same batch of laws. <laughs> Another one banned inter interracial marriage. Another one defined the age of consent as 10 years old. That's the, that's the, that's the generation of laws that their abortion law came from. And, and listen and listeners should know that I, I lived in Arizona like during my formative high school years. And then I was actually, I had to go back there for family reasons before I moved to Australia. So I'm very, very familiar with the state and there's something in the water there. It's not a, um, not a really focused state. I might've mentioned this before, but one of my memories growing up, my father getting a new pickup truck and be going out in the front yard in the driveway and systematically removing the seat belts and throwing them on the ground because Jimmy Carter wasn't going to tell him that he had to wear seatbelts. So that's the kind <laughs> of um, world that people in Arizona, um, um, that, that, that's at root and that kind of stuff. But, yeah. but it's very, very much changing. And the Christian cinema election was just an extra, was by far the, the most incredible, um, you know, the most surprising win of that cycle that she actually pulled that off, so. Sure, but as you say, there's a, they, 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 there's a bit of freedom in, in Arizona, there's a bit of a freedom agenda. And if a mulatto wants to testify against a white in court, they are going to in Arizona. <laughs> and, and they won't like an 1864 anti-abortion law. And then, and the other thing, of course, that this abortion thing is going to have play a big effect was with the Kerry Lake race, which is the gubernatorial race yes. there. Yes. And she's a very strange person on so many levels and is sort of a joke candidate, except she used to be a TV presenter. And, and she's so winning. Yeah, so there's a really good chance that she actually might win, even though she's um, really a pernicious person. Yeah, well, I was going to say, the senator, the senator, senator for Arizona, obviously has nothing to do with the 1864 Arizona anti-abortion law. But what this does, but the attorney general is the person who will decide whether to enforce this law or not. And the Republican running for attorney general is saying they are going to enforce this law. The Democrat running for attorney general is saying they won't. Now, who will win that? That I don't know. But all I know is the presence of that race makes abortion a constant issue in Arizona up to this election. And while abortion is a major issue, that helps Mark Kelly, like I said. So the so that's why I think 
They're very like Mark Kelly is very like keep going away. Also, Blake Masters is a terrible candidate. He flip flops all over the place. He's very inauthentic. And I have to disagree with something you said before about the wasted money from Peter Thiel. Peter Thiel hasn't spent a cent a cent on his general election. He spent all his money in the primary. But oh, he's I been, didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah. been a cheap ass in, in in the general election. And Trump who also endorsed Blake Masters hasn't, hasn't given him a cent either. And Mitch McConnell has abandoned him as well, which means he's got no money. And Mark Kelly is just a cash register. So Mark Kelly is just burying him in advertising at the moment as well. So for all those reasons, I would be very surprised if the Democrats didn't win Arizona. Do you have anything else to say about Arizona before we move on? Nope. No, okay, Ohio. That's yeah. the, the 538 projection there is, is J.D. Vance by three and a half. Uh, right. go, go on. Yes, what are you going to say? Well, well, that's like another one of the, let me just catch this thing up. Hold on. Um, I was trying to get ahead of you here. The um, <laughs> Now, and he is another one of the, um, um, you know, worst people in the world who's running um, in these races. He's anti-gay, he's anti-abortion, lies. And, um, and he, he, but he has this celebrity for having written that book, um, Hillbilly Elegy. And let's not remember that Ron Howard, who's supposedly one of these, you know, Hollywood liberals made a movie based on the book. Um, and, um, but Ohio, it's, it's really a red state now. Mm -hmm. And I just don't see how he's going to lose though. That race should be a lot closer. And what is, um, yeah. And, 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 um, 538 says Tim Ryan, who's the democratic challenger, yeah. uh, only has a one in three chance, mm -hmm. but even that, I mean, you have to admit, this is kind of a weird, um, election year that, um, um, that it is even that close, but I don't think Ohio is going to go democratic at all. No, I don't. I think Tim Ryan is the best candidate they could have there. I think he's a good candidate generally, and he's a very, he's he couldn't be running any harder against Biden. Uh, like he's, he's he might as well be a Republican. He's running so hard against Biden there. Um, the uh, and and it's working in the extent to the extent that it's at least a close race. Whereas yeah. the governor at the moment is winning by like fifteen points like the, the the republican governor it's, it's a red state as you say so and and, and vance is ahead by three and a half points slowly like according to 538 slowly going away uh i mean biden's approval is 39 percent in ohio it's impossible for a democrat to win when biden's right. approval is 39 percent right but actually i wanted there was one thing that was disturbing me that there is a um there's a tightening of the rate uh, 538 is saying there's some tightening of the races um um in favor of the Republicans in a lot of these races. Mm. But but one of, I was trying to remember which one of these this was, and it's Ohio, that Ohio is actually, Vance's support has been steadily going down for mm. months and months. It's not, it's not one of these where it's going up and down. It's just been this gradual thing. So that race has been tightening the whole way, and I can't ever see it coming um, close. But it is kind of interesting that that could be a good example of um, some of the lingering regrets that um, some Republican independents have about uh, Republicans having had so much power over the last five or six years. Sure. Personally, yeah, I, 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 I think Vance gets there on the back of the coattails of Mike DeWine, myself, the governor, the, uh, who's running for re-election, who's incredibly popular. Uh, North Carolina, the 538 projection there is that the Republicans win by three. That's it's a Duke of Bud. Uh, Beasley is a, Shell Beasley is a Democrat. Uh, she's a, like a judge and she's relatively popular, but I mean, so you say what you think about North Carolina, first of all, before I say, well, just the thing, uh, the funny thing about North Carolina, and I think I read an article about this a while back that, um, Obama won North Carolina and it was just kind of a crazy election. You know, people forget that I, and he won, um, Indiana, right? Mm -hmm. So it was kind of a very odd election. So ever since then, um, Virginia has been, it went gone from purple to pretty much being a blue state. And so people thought that North Carolina is going next. There's a, what they call the um, research triangle of Durham, Chapel Hill and Raleigh, a lot of, um, uh, universities there. And there was a chance, there was a sense that that was going to, um, create the suburban swing toward the Democrats. Um, but let me tell you, it's been what, almost 15 years and it doesn't seem to be happening. There's no. huge toxic. Um, it's basically a Southern state still. There's a toxic mentality in the state. And um, I don't see that race going the other way. But again, it's just kind of amazing that it isn't even that close right now. It could be a lot worse. Yeah, North Carolina, for me, has been the great tease of uh, 
the Democrats for the last decade. Like you say, it's always close. It's always close. It's always within four or five points, but the Republicans basically win every time. And I see no reason why that would change now. This is a classic example of what I'm talking the issues. 12% said abortion is their number one issue. 41% said the economy was. That's in an Emerson poll. Uh, they, I just... I, I, I haven't seen any movement towards the Democrats in this one. I think that yeah. the Republicans will hold it like they always do in North Carolina. I totally agree. And there is this one other thing, though, that, that one of the weird things that happened in America that I don't think gets remembered all the time is that basically Trump created this deal, new alignment, right? And basically a lot of um, – and forgive me for being so dismissive and contemptuous sometimes, but there's a lot of people in America who are just – who's – who have been completely out of bounds. And I think it's totally a fair. I don't believe in being contemptuous or looking down on people in America at all, okay? But at the same time, the people who support the vulgarity, the hatefulness, the racism, the insurrection, the lying, the indolence, the, um, you know, just that lying in your face, lack of shame, I think they deserve contempt, okay? So what you have is the worst parts of the Democratic Party have basically swung over into the right and then a lot of obviously disaffected Republicans have gone into the independents and blah, blah, blah. So, so basically, you, um, Trump has um, consolidated the um, least educated, most racist, sort of most hateful elements of American society. And he also brought a lot of those people out of the woodwork, okay? Because mm -hmm. we have to remember that Trump got a lot of votes. Um, you know, Trump got more votes in 2020 than any presidential candidate ever had except for Joe Biden, right? Mm -hmm. So actually creating a lot of new votes so um and then the big question is are all those people going to continue to come out in those sorts of states and i think that's a little bit of a um you know there that that's one theory of why some of the polls were off like how many of the people are actually going to come out and vote you had surprising turnouts in places like florida and you just don't know if um, these are not the most organized, focused, um, together people in the world. They get really riled up by Trump and come out. And if they still do that this year, that might have an effect. On the other hand, you also might see a drop off. And you do have Democrats who are riled up about things like abortion, even if the polls don't reflect it. Yeah. I should also say, by the way, you mentioned Florida. I should say that uh, Rubio is pulling away in Florida, probably off the back of Ron DeSantis' coattails, I, was, I would suggest. So I don't think there's much chance the Democrats win that either. If you add the, all that up, Florida stays Republican, Ohio stays Republican, North Carolina stays Republican, Wisconsin stays Republican, Arizona stays Democrat. Nothing's changed except for there's three states left. These are the big three. They're Pennsylvania, Georgia, and Nevada. Now, my theory, these are the three closest states. These are the ones that are where all the interest is. And whoever, if you do, if you count the numbers, two out of three wins in those three states wins you the Senate. If whether you're the Republican or the Democrat, Pennsylvania, Georgia, and Nevada. Well, that was such an amazing revelation I just gave you that the Senate will be won by two out of the, whoever wins two out of three contests out of Pennsylvania, Georgia, and Nevada, in my view, that the entire world stopped for 24 hours and we all had to take a break and we have now picked up our tools again 24 hours later to finish off this podcast which wasn't really going that long but just uh, the, just the enormity yeah, of the revelations I mean, and there's obviously a lot to talk about as um this incredible election gets closer and closer so there is, um, there is. So can we move to um, Pennsylvania, speaking of incredible elections? Let's move on to Pennsylvania. Okay, so, we're, so the 538 projection is that John Fetterman is going to win by four points, according to the 538 this point in time against Dr. Oz. But that margin, that projection has closed considerably in the last few weeks. It was at one point in time, only about a month ago, it was about a 12-point projection margin. And now it's a four-point and it's closing rapidly. What do you have to say about Fetterman versus Dr. Oz, Bill? Well, it just, well, again, so many crazy things are happening. We we almost forget that we got this, we, we have this election between Fetterman is that it's an insane-looking 
very unusual candidate, like probably not since, um, what's his face in Minnesota, Jesse Ventura, yeah. have we seen quite some unconventionally looking candidate, acting candidate, but he's definitely a working person's candidate, which I think is really going to help him. Um, and he had a stroke a couple months ago and basically disappeared for a month. So just that would be a, a very difficult thing for a lot of candidates. But A, because he is just the sort of candidate he is, he's basically pretty much overcome that. And um, and I think we can expect tightening. You know, race is always tight before we get to the, um, or I shouldn't say always, but often. And um, and then you have a, the Republican candidate, who's Mehmet Oz, who's even more insane. So this is one of the weirdest um, candidate. This is one of the weirdest matchups in a year of odd matchup. And Mehmet Oz, of course, is a shyster TV doctor who has gone through decades of um, attacks for um, promulgating crappy stuff um, and feel good remedies and stuff like that to his gullible audience. He's been basically disavowed by doctors all over New York that he used to work with. And he's basically seen as a clown. So, of course, he hitched himself to the Trump bandwagon. And, and the other great thing about it is, of course, he doesn't really even live in Pennsylvania. He's a New Jersey person. And so um, the, the left has been able to tar him as a carpetbagger as well. And he's been a remarkably poor and flawed candidate. Um, and so I, kind, I know that the race is tightening, but it's just really hard to see um, how that is not going, how that's going to come out well for Oz. And, um, and just one thing, one just the last thing I'll say is that just in this overall point as we get closer, that there, as we were talking about earlier, the Dobbs decision, um, polls are always dealing with very complex issues, obviously. I'm not one of the people who just smears polls because it's a very complicated thing, process and there's a lot of smart people who work on them. But I think it's fair to say we are going to see something of a changed electorate because of the Dobbs decision, because of the new people registering, uh, perhaps because of opposition among young men that um, that we don't anticipate so much as women. And there's very complex metrics when it comes to the gender gap between both parties related to the Dobbs decision. So I think those are the sort of things that make me think that even if it is tightening, it's certainly, it, it's really gonna be a crazy time um, if Oz were to win this. I mean, what do you think? Look, I, th I think that, for, first of all, the first thing I want to say is that I think Dobbs is extremely inconvenient for Dr. Oz for different reasons to what you, for, than you might think. Certainly different reasons to any other Republican candidate. And that is that one of, I think the reason why Dr. Oz was 12 points down a few months back was because Republicans didn't like him. It wasn't, it wasn't because the entire of Pennsylvania just had no time for him. It's because he actually was possibly more unpopular amongst Republicans than he was amongst independents. Like the Republicans really didn't like him because he wasn't really a Republican. He wasn't a conservative. He was pro-choice for one until quite recently. And then all of a sudden he had this, uh, <laughs> this, this revelation that he was actually pro-life and wanted to run for the Republicans. Um, they didn't trust him. Well, they didn't trust him, Republicans. They didn't think he was one of them at all. They thought he was, well, he was much like Trump himself, which was someone who wasn't at all conservative until he decided he was. Um, and so the Dobbs issue, when, when, when that doesn't help Dr. Oz at all because it doesn't motivate Republicans because they don't trust Dr. Oz when it comes to abortion. They, they think he could stab them in the back. And I feel like the reason why he's closed the gap so much is because they ran a very, very nasty ad campaign based on crime. And that convinced Republicans that actually he's not too bad <laughs> because the, uh, because he, 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 through the use of crime as an issue, he convinced them that to ignore everything else and he's actually one of them. And I think that's the reason he's, he's come back and, and it's become a genuinely tight contest, which is what you would expect in Pennsylvania. So I, I, yeah, so I, I wouldn't take the plus 12 margins from months ago as the natural state. I would take the tied race as the natural state, which is what you expect from Pennsylvania which is what we're approaching yeah, and, now. And, and, right, and we also have to remember, as we were saying earlier, that the, that the context for this election is a difficult election for Democrats. Mm, yes. That absent Dobbs, absent, you know, 
um, Trump's continuing interference and and the specter of insurrection and all this other stuff, this would be a very, very difficult election for Democrats. And and that's and, and what you're getting at, I think that's really true about the crime thing, but it's also that thing that at a certain point, Republicans sort of decide, okay, look, yeah, we don't like him, but good Lord, we hate Democrats even more that we don't like him. So people mm -hmm. kind of naturally sort of um, with, you know, sort of come home to the party maybe. So I think that's kind of natural too. Yeah. Um, I still would much be, ra I, you know, you'd much rather be betting on um, uh, Fetterman than Oz at this point. Sure. I, I'll just say a couple other things about why I think it's tightening up and, and why for me, it's actually really, really tough to pick. I mean, if I, if I had to put my house on it, I'd probably, I'd probably say Featherman just because I think that it's unusual for one candidate to have momentum for the, for the, for the period that Oz has the last like two months and to not have a, a uh, some kind of bump in the road and at this point in time if you have a bump in the road you lose so I, I think that I think that the if I if I had to put my house on it I put on Fetterman but really for me it's like a 55 45 percent situation I would not be at all surprised if Oz is the winner this is the reason why I've got this is one of the last three contests we're talking about because I just do not know um, but just a couple of aspects some one reason why I think it's really closed up and like I said, I talked about the crime campaign. Mitch McConnell has dumped an enormous amount of money in this race. This is where he's been cashing his chips, which number one is probably a sign he thinks they can win it because he's not, he's a pretty smart operator, Mitch McConnell. Um, and it helps a lot um, when you have this a huge amount of money uh, bankrolling an ad campaign. Uh, the, and, and also, Oz is one of the very few people who can match the Democrats on fundraising as well. Like in the third quarter, uh, Fetterman raised 22 million and Oz raised 17 million, which is not as much, but at least it's a level playing field compared to some of the other races where they've been like, like Arizona, where they've been blown out of the water, Republicans on fundraising. Uh, and by the way, just in the last 24 hours, the fact that we delayed this podcast <laughs> the end of this podcast, there's been a small change, a tiny change in what I talked about in the first one. If I was dishonest, I would edit out what we, what we talked about yesterday in one little bit, which is the MAGA Inc. has finally put some money into a race. They put a little bit, a teensy, 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 they only put a couple of hundred thousand dollars into this race. But maybe this might indicate that, uh, that Trump may put a few chips into Pennsylvania. This this does appear to be the critical state, or at least one of three, at the very least. But anyway, so so there's this huge ad campaign, and that's going to continue over the next few weeks. Uh, secondly, I think I think we just need to call out reality here, which is that it's an issue that Fenneman is not recovering as rapidly as he would hope from this stroke. The, yeah. the stroke came three months ago, and I think everyone thought, okay, it's going to take a long time for him to recover. Um, and they gave him some allowances because of that. But even now, he's still pretty, he's, 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 he's let's just say, he's fragile on the stump. Like, he mixes up words a lot. He, um, he will, I mean, it's not, it's not like he can't speak. He can, but just he constantly reminds you that he's recovering from a stroke. Let's put it that way. I don't mean, I don't mean with his words. I mean the way he conducts himself. It's obvious he's recovering from a stroke. And I think the closer you get to an election, the more of a problem that is. And when there's a debate, which is going to be soon, I think that's going to be a very, very critical debate. If, if, if Fenner can get through that debate, then I think that will help a lot. Sorry, Bill, what are you going to say? Yeah, no, I think that's a really, really, really good point. And, um, but, and, but in, in, in response to your first point, though, let's yeah. also remember that, that, um, it, that Mitch McConnell is going to dump a lot of money in this race because he has to. I mean, there's no other race really yeah. he can put money into. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, and again, the other thing, I don't know if people know, Phil, Pennsylvania is still one of those um, interesting sort of upper um, Atlantic seaboard working class. You know, there's kind of that Chicago, Midwest, Pittsburgh, tough person kind of um, element there mm -hmm. that is very... A lot of the things about Fetterman would be a lot more difficult if he was a polished Mitt Romney type or a very, um, you know, coat and tie politician. But um, he's 
he's really one of those weird Democrats who can really um, pr protect himself from a lot of that. So I think he's got a lot, he, that there's not a lot of independence. Uh, there's going to be a lot of independents who feel very comfortable with him. Yeah. A lot of Democrats who feel, you know, it's not like he's going to be, he's not one of those plastic uh, uh, with now, now, although having said that, yeah. one of the attacks they are making on him through their ads is that he's a phony. They're saying he's actually a rich guy who pretends he's a he's a working class kind of stiff. The uh, which may or may not be an effective attack. I don't know. I actually haven't seen many of the ads, but I know that that is they're trying to get to his authenticity. That is they, maybe, they, they, maybe, maybe Oz can bring in the Duck Dynasty boys, and they. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think one thing that Oz has done. That's a great idea. Is he hasn't tried to out working class Federman. That is, that would be very, very silly. <laughs> and, um, I was going to say as well that the that that Federman has a few vulnerabilities that they have attacked as well. Um, in in that crime, as I said, is a massive issue in Pennsylvania. They have. They have this um, progressive attorney in Philadelphia, probably the most progressive attorney, this guy called Larry Krasner, who is, it was controversial to the right and they're trying to make him into the devil. And they're trying to basically blame the crime bumps that have occurred across the entire country, including the Republican areas and the rural areas. And we're going to talk about this on Planet America on Monday, so I'm not going to spoil it now. But uh, they, uh, they try to turn that into some kind of morality play about progressive prosecutors and the progressive uh, DAs. And, and, this, and, and ground zero of that is Pennsylvania. And so Federman, if you look at his track record, and they certainly, they certainly try and make you look at it in their advertising campaign, he was at one point in time the chair of the Board of Pardons in Pennsylvania. And as chair, he recommended 50 commutations of life sentences, including second degree and third degree murderers. And uh, that, that compares to the four years before him when there was a commutation of just six life sentences. Now, I'm a fan of commutating senses that are overly harsh and and if people have repented and all the rest of it or if people are there for too long i mean I, i'm a fan of of criminal justice reform i haven't changed my mind on that but at this point in time the people who were pro criminal justice reform a couple of years ago are now getting punished in the current environment and Federman is one of those people oz loves referring to him as the most pro murderer politician in the country that's the phrase most pro murderer politician in the country so they're just hitting him over the head with that over and over again the fact that Federman has scrubbed his website the black lives matter messaging suggests to me that the attacks are working so the um and it's a sensitive issue in america and it goes all the way back remember to the infamous willie horton ads yeah. Michael Dukakis back in the day that it's a it's it's a political trope in America that Democrats like letting murderers loose to go mm. blah 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 and of course and again the the Demo it's just like I was saying earlier the Democrats are just so bad on inoculating themselves about this because yeah. um, when Biden came in the office he could have said oh my God crime has spiked under Trump which it did yeah. right yeah. you remember that infamous yeah. thing when Kaylee Min what's her face. Um, tweeted out that thing about how much crime had just gone up under Biden. And it was the figures from 2019 to 2020. <laughs> yes. Yes. And, um, and, you know, and again, he could have just totally gone to, and Bill Clinton would have done that. You know, mm -hmm. Bill Clinton would have gone to town. You know, every time he opened his mouth, he would have said, oh, my God, crime went up so much after Donald Trump. We got to do something about that. And of course, they haven't. So absolutely. Oh, by the way, just on my stroke point from before, I, I missed the poll out, which which is an important poll to illustrate what I'm talking about. 34%, according to Fox, and their polls are real polls, they're not bullshit polls. 34% of voters were extremely or very worried that Federman's health will render him unable to complete his duties in the Senate after his stroke. Uh, sorry, sorry, 23% in June were, were extremely or very worried that Federman's health would render him unable to complete his duties in the Senate. 34% yeah. say that now. So it's gone up since his stroke, 11%. That's true. Yeah. yeah. yeah so we also have to remember, though, that a lot of that is going to be driven by coverage that on Fox News and stuff like that. Oh, that's the other thing. Fox are all over him. Fox have attacked. I've got the, I've got the numbers here. Fox uh, prime Fox prime time hosts have attacked Fenneman 120 times in the last month, which is more mentions 
than the other six key Senate races combined. They've, they've really made a point of going after Featherman. Yeah, there's unquestionably that sort of coordination um, between these political campaigns and between the specific needs of political campaigns and the coverage on Fox. And I remember earlier I was talking about, I was digging through foxnews.com, just trying to find out mm. articles on Herschel Walker, mm. um, who we'll get to in a second. Yeah. And, um, um, and you can't find anything. You, mm. It's really, really hard to find the actual details about Herschel Walker. So. Absolutely. Okay, so um, I don't want to run out of time. So can we move on to Nevada? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, sorry. Yeah, we, we can. I just, I just wanted to say just, just one more thing. Uh, to, to just, I just finish off quickly on 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 uh, Fenderman. I just want to say that uh, as, as as well as that, there's an there's an attack on him which I think is potentially quite effective, which is that he ten years ago he pulled a gun on a black jogger. He racially profiled <laughs> him, and they've run so many ads about that, and. And the the black the the black support in Pennsylvania is not good. Suffolk has had uh, seventy one percent support for Fenneman in June amongst black voters, and it's now fifty six percent amongst black voters. So I think the ad campaign, as shameless as it is, is actually working. So that's it, and the, so that's another thing. And the final thing I'd say about him, just quickly, is that I actually think that he's run running the wrong campaign. I think he's running an unserious campaign that revolves around memes and smart assery and smart aleck remarks. He goes on and on and on about Dr. Oz killing dogs because, because Dr. Oz was involved in some research where other people killed, the, the, the dogs died during this research. It's the kind of thing that we would normally laugh at and we'd say, oh, that's just that's just ridiculous. But he's actually making, he just doesn't shut up about it. He's going on and on and on about the killing of dogs. And he, he records videos with him petting dogs and going, oh, yeah, Dr. Oz would kill this one. You know, watch out, watch out for Dr. Oz. And like he thinks, I mean, he's trying to be funny and that's cool. But number one, he doesn't talk policy ever. He just does smart assery all the time. When you ask him a serious question, he responds with smart assery. But much more importantly than that, I think it plays into the stroke thing poorly because he can't deliver a line at the moment. He mixes up the lines. They're very, stol they're very they're like they're very, very stilted and unnatural, and it makes him seem like he's regurgitating prepared lines when he when he buggers up a line that is an answer to a question which is completely irrelevant, and he just throws in these. He's basically memorized twelve smart ass remarks about Dr. Oz. He just keeps on recycling and buggering them up, and I feel like that does not help him at all. And if I was him, I'd just get serious. I really think he needs to. And well, I think that, that anyway, but that's just my thought on. Well, that. That's such a good point too, because what I, the way I've interpreted a lot of the stuff he does mm -hmm. is that he's one of these guys who knows his state mm -hmm. and who knows his appeal and how to do it. And, mm -hmm. um, and so I was kind of giving him pluses for that, but I think that's a really good counter analysis too. Mm -hmm. You yeah. could be right. But anyway, um, and we'll the see. thing I assume though, is that the sort of adults in the democratic party are handling the the sort of online advertising and all the kind of coordinated um uh um uh, what, what do you call it um, focus grouped yeah. messages effectively you know kind of um on the ground so to speak so um but i you know because i'm just assuming that these things are again we don't get you know it used to be 20 years ago you'd see all the ads on tv and you'd kind of know what the things were mm -hmm. and now these days it's all very complicated and if i'm a a white guy living in Philadelphia, I'm going to see completely different ads than if I'm a working class woman living, you know, in an exurb of Pittsburgh or something mm -hmm. like that. So yeah. um, okay. it's very hard to read these things anymore. Yeah. All right. Like I, 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 we should move on to Nevada, like you said. Uh, that's Catherine Cortez Masto versus Adam Laxalt. The 538 projection is a tie. <laughs> we, this, we have no idea where this is going. Um, what are your thoughts on this one? Well, Nevada is such a weird state, right? Because mm -hmm. it's considered to be, um, and you know, it, I mean, in American political circles as well, known. I'm sure you know it too, and I, I don't know how much the listeners do, but Nevada is a state that's supposed to be a blue state and is kind of sort of a blue state, okay? But it's not a blue state yet. And it isn't even really a purple state. It's like mm -hmm. it's basically a light blue state that sometimes goes red. So it's very hard to read. Um, Obama did so well there. Of course, Harry Reid was from Nevada and always did well. Um, but no one is taking this for, for granted. And Laxalt, of course, is a famous family name in Nevada. So 
um, he's got that going for him. Yeah. Um, you know, again, um, sort of all things being equal, you would expect a Democrat to win there. Um, but of course, there are a lot of Democratic headwinds. Laxalt has a great family name there. And Nevada has a very, very weird demographics there. It's sort of a, in certain ways, it's a poor Sunbelt state, sort of like Arizona is a little bit different from New Mexico, but sort of like Arizona or New Mexico a lot. But of course, you've got Las, Las Vegas and Reno completely throwing things out of whack. And you have an industry there that is um, that dominates the state's economy in a very, very bizarre way. Now, on the other hand, it's a big union state. OK, so um, Biden is a you know, so obviously he's got a lot of um, um, that that helps the Democrats a little bit. But of course, this is a, a um, election with Democratic headwinds. So it's really hard to figure out. Is this a state that Democrats would be winning decently absent? Um, you know, if this were just sort of a normal presidential election without inflation. Um, and so it's completely understandable that, of course, she's facing these headwinds. Um, is this one of those things where there is going to be some hidden uh, new registrations because of Dobbs that are going to put her ahead ultimately. It's very, very interesting. But Laxalt is a big, big, big name in, in um, Las Vegas. But even then, mitigating against that is Las Vegas is also one of those states, Sunbelt states, where you'd have this enormous, enormous turnover of people, new people coming in every year, people leaving every year. So they don't have the, oh yeah, the old Laxalt family. So you just don't know. Yeah, yeah. Look, at, for me, there are two major issues with Nevada uh, that make it very difficult for the Democrats, which is not to say that I don't think they're going to win, although my guess would be the Republicans are going to win this one. Um, the two major issues for me are that demographically, uh, Nevada is becoming less and less suitable to the Democrats because there is a very, very low number of college educated voters in Nevada and the Democrats are moving further and further towards that kind of party. Um, they rely a lot on the Latinos in Nevada. Nevada Latinos are a, is a large proportion of the voting population and Latinos recently have been moving away from Democrats. Not, they're not all the way moved towards Republicans yet, but they're, they used to be able to bank a huge number of Latino votes that these days are not guaranteed. For Democrats, they, 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 10 years ago was like a 40 point margin towards Latinos. Now it's more like a 15 to 20 point margin. And those votes make a difference. Um, in particular, the big thing that's changed is conservative Latinos vote Republican, whereas they didn't used to vote Republican. They either voted for Democrats or no one. Um, the, I've got the numbers here in a Telemundo poll. In 2012, conservative Hispanics were voted Democrat by nine points. Now they vote Republican by 56 points. So that gives you an idea of how things have changed. They're basically Republicans now. Conservatives well, the, the are the Republicans. And there, there's a lot of studies about um, Im, the, how immigrants fare in America. You have that first generation, mm. then they start having kids, their political views start moderating. Then all of a sudden they're the grandparents and they have, you know, their, their kids have kids and they see their kids as kids and they horrify yeah. them. Yes. And so, um, just like the boomers do. So it's this natural thing that, um, you know, and, you know, it's something that someone like me watches and, you know, I blink and you think, oh, this is the way Latinos are. But actually that was 20 years ago. Mm. There's an entire new generation of Latinos. And with, you know, you, you have this amazing change in each generation of these immigrant um, experiences in America. And it's something that people have been studying literally since 1900 and um, people still get surprised by it. And of course it does have a lot of effect in Arizona. Um, where I used to live, obviously, so I followed that very carefully. And um, though, though in, in Arizona, you know, it's pretty, they're pretty good for Democrats there, mm. um, mostly because Republicans in Arizona are so um, outlandishly racist and explicitly racist. Yeah. And then, then you have a completely different thing in New Mexico, which has a much less heated sort of political world. And that's basically always been a reliable, uh, pretty, that's a, been a pretty reliable blue state. So, um, it's super, I totally agree with you. It's totally a, a toss up and I honestly have no idea how it's going. Well, yeah, and the other factor is petrol prices because um, petrol prices, we've talked about petrol prices nationally, but every state has their own prices. Nevada has very high petrol prices, very high. Um, the national average is $3.86 per gallon, up from $2.38 when, when Biden took over. Uh, in Nevada, it's, I can't believe I didn't write it down. It's, I, it's, 
it's five dollars from memory is five dollars sixty at the moment in the value. Wow, that would really surprise me, but maybe there's mm -hmm. something I don't know about because um, there's sort of a well known trope in the southwest is that if you're driving across you want to fill up in Arizona before you get to California because California has all those high gas tax. And I've, you know, I've gone to Las Vegas a lot over the years. I've never really noticed the gas prices there being higher than Arizona, but um, you can yeah, be right. Hang on, I'll tell you, I, 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 I'm actually looking up even as we speak. I'll tell you, I'll tell you right now, it is $5.51 right at this second. So there we go. There must so, be extraordinarily high state gas taxes in Nevada that I didn't know about. And Nevada is also another one of those weird things where you do have this huge percentage of the population down there in um, Henderson County and Las Vegas County down at the very, you know, point, southern point of the state. Um, there's not very many other people in the state except in uh, Reno and then a few in Carson City. I so it is basically, it, Nevada is a state that has Las Vegas and then not too much else. I think petrol prices out west in general are extremely expensive. I think that, I think California is clearly the most expensive. Like California is over six bucks a gallon at the moment. So Nevada might be cheap, compared to California, but it's not cheap anywhere else. <laughs> so it's, uh, That's very surprising to me. I yeah, don't know. Yeah. But anyway, um, yeah. and then there, like, there's one other issue. But then uh, the other thing you really got to remember, too, is that that Las Vegas is a pretty liberal place. And mm. it's not the place that likes, um, you know, abortion legislation, super moralizing yeah. thing. There is, you know, there is sort of a Mormon population there. Harry Reid was a Mormon, I think. Mm. And um, but you don't get that's the kind of state that's going to be really um, going full in with a lot of um, the sanctimonious um, morality plays you get on the right. So that's another kind of factor that mitigates it going. Um, it's very it's a very different state from and then and then but the other thing is you know Sheldon Adelson died too. So that's right. That's another thing you don't know what his wife is doing. Big time Republican diner for those who don't know. Yeah, and he's yeah, no, from the yeah, yeah. billionaire guy who. Um, just does ridiculous, ridiculous um, multi-million dollar interventions and all stuff. And it's also a guy who has casinos in Macau, so you know he's mm -hmm. dealing with the worst people in the world. And all the Republican candidates, including Trump, you know, go to Las Vegas and suck up to him and kiss his ring and stuff like that because he's got so much money to throw at. Okay, so are you going Democrats on in Nevada? It sounds like you're leaning Democrat. No, honestly, it's it's yeah. I, I kind of basically well no. It's again, it's one of those things where ordinarily I think, okay, the Democrats can mm -hmm. safely win. You do have all these headwinds, you expect them to be a little bit ahead there. Um, I, in a tie thing, though, I think what I would argue is that there's going to be a percentage or two of turnout, um, anti Dobbs sort of turnout. So okay. I kind of I would make it 50.5 versus 49.5 right now, but otherwise, sure. I don't know. Okay, I'm, I'm as uh, uh, all these three IC races are toss ups for me, but I'm the opposite. I'm 50.5 to 49.5 thinking Republican. If I if I had to put my house on this, I would say it's a Republican. And if I put my house on on Pennsylvania, I would say it's Democrat, but either either option could could occur. But that means the critical state is Georgia. Tell us about Georgia, Bill. Georgia is this fascinating state, and I assume some people, you know, people at least are familiar with the dynamics of it, that there's this guy named Herschel Walker, yeah. who was a famous football star at the University of Georgia, and the, the fighting Bulldogs, and um, this is American football, and in the South and in the Midwest, um, college football is this enormous, huge, huge um, sort of thing that you really can't, um, that doesn't really come across in sort of the eastern seaboard and the western seaboard and different countries mm -hmm. but as i think we made reference to on the on the podcast before quite often the highest paid public employee in a lot of these states is the university football coaches making yeah. millions of dollars that's how big it is you have stadiums that have a hundred thousand people in the middle of nowhere in some of these states um, so he was a famous star. Now that was a long time ago, but he is considered to be a state hero. And I don't know anything about sports. I don't care about sports. And I lived in Atlanta for a year. And I can tell you that Herschel Walker is one of those names that you just hear, even though back then, I mean, that would have been 20 or 30 years previously. Mm -hmm. So um, out of nowhere, because he's a buddy of Trump, he comes out and decides to run for Senate. Now we had this guy, Raphael Warnock, who narrowly, as we know, two years ago, narrowly won that seat. So he's running as a as an incumbent. He's a black preacher and specifically he comes from the Ebenezer Baptist Church, which is Dr. Um, Reverend Martin Luther King Jr.'s church, uh, you know, in the Auburn section of Atlanta. So he has a famous name. 
He ran for election. He narrowly won. So he's running as an incumbent. And Herschel Walker beat out a few other kind of more serious candidates on the Republican primary side and has become the candidate. Now, the problem for Republicans is that even in a party that's had these completely awful, laughable, comical, flawed, scandal-ridden, embarrassing, tongue-tied, buffoonish candidates over the past 10 years, okay, to the point where it became a cliche where every two or four years you say, oh, the clown car of Republican candidates, um, which is what they often came, um, uh, came to seem to be like. Um, I don't know if the Republicans have ever quite had a candidate quite as bad, quite as inappropriate, quite as bad a speaker, quite as scandal ridden, quite as a liar, um, and, um, and also the enormity of what he did with the possible exception of the guy in Alabama who, uh, um, you know, was the predatory guy with teenage girls. Roy Moore, so, yeah. Um, yeah. so that's the dynamic right there. And, and this gets overlooked. There's this interesting phenomenon in America that as a journalist, I find really interesting in the Trump era that there are people like Trump, the people around him, the lawyers, Giuliani, other people who have so many awful things going on that it becomes exhausting even to list them all. Mm. And so you have stories about Herschel Walker where that, that just don't even bother to talk about things that in any other candidate would be a disqualifying mm. matter for them, which I find interesting. And so, so people should just know that this is the guy who's had 40 years of businesses now, unbelievably checkered um, career. He's lied repeatedly about his businesses, the status of them. He'd say he ran the largest upholstery business in America or something like this, the mm. largest chicken thing, the largest minority on this. And basically it turned out he hasn't done any of that stuff. He lent his name to a chicken company. He's done a few other things, um, but this vast majority of everything he's given himself credit for in the business world has been lies. And he of course has had a whole bunch of legal checkered um, history. And for example, there's this legal case that went on there. He was basically found um, to be liable for $600,000 and you can't even find out what the disposition of it was. Mm -hmm. But the last I could find out, the judge said, yes, you owe these guys $600,000. So. Um, it's not even clear if he's on the run for that. Um, there's a whole bunch of others. Then you have all his domestic issues um, with his wives and stuff like that. Um, I don't even think they're allegations of domestic violence. I mean, there's domestic violence. He held a gun to his wife's head. Um, then it turned out that he had all the, he had one child that he talked about. It turned out he had at least three others by three other different women, which again, this is for someone running on a family values, yeah. hard right anti-abortion republic. Ticket. Yeah, who and, made a, made a big deal out of men abandoning their children? Like oh, that's right. one yeah. of his central issues. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, the whole like Bill Cosby syndrome, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where you get um, you become a celebrity on the right by being a black person who attacks black people on all these um, moral issues that conveniently fit into the racist mm -hmm. paradigms mm -hmm. that they attribute to black people, um, and of course they themselves being examples of that racist stereotype to a degree that you can't even really imagine it. Okay, so two other interesting things are happening. One is that, um, that the biggest bombshell, um, so anyway, that's the setup for yeah. the raid. And believe oh, 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 by the way, sorry, before we go on, we should also Whoa. say one more reason why he's a terrible candidate. There's so many. He hasn't even lived in Georgia for decades. He's from Texas, not from Georgia. But anyway, go on. <laughs> yes. Yeah, here's the thing. Like in the past few days, I've been reading all these articles about him and I don't, I didn't even come across them. Yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, you, you keep so, talking. Yeah. So anyway, so now the latest thing, the Daily Beast did this. The Daily Beast, which has just been dogging him, and the oh, and then there's this whole other thing that doesn't even really lies to level national attention, which is that everyone on his campaign hates him, thinks he's a liar, wants him to lose, and is leaking ferociously explaining how awful he is and how basically people inside his campaign are basically yeah. saying oh, shouldn't vote for this guy. So they know even worse. So anyway. So I guess what was happening for a long time is people knew there was this, this abortion issue with him. So finally, the Daily Beast found this woman who said, look, at not only did um, I, he get me pregnant, but he, he told me to get an abortion and he gave me the money for it. He wrote me a card and I have the check. Yeah. <laughs> so then and so, of course, um, all the people around him say, oh, people, they're, they're you know, they're, it's the classic Republican thing where on the one hand, they say they're lying. And then on the other hand, they say, oh, well, that was in my past. I've redeemed myself. So you can't even tell whether he's saying I did it and I'm sorry or what he said explicitly several times now that it's all a lie. The latest Daily Beast story is that the woman who told the story was one of the four women that he's already had a child with. Yes. 
So, okay. Yeah. So he says he still doesn't know who it is, even though it's narrowed down to four at this point. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, let, 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 let me actually just play you the clip of him on Hannity just oh, saying, yeah. saying that he had no idea who the woman was. And you can also see the tenor of his defenses as well. First question, do you know the woman that is making this allegation? I have no, no idea, but it is a flat out lie. And, uh, and now you know how important this seat is. This seat is very important that they'll do anything to win this seat, lie, because they want to make it by everything else except what the true problems that we have in this country is, this inflation, the border wide open, crime. So, so you can say it, it, this is his line. His line is, I have no idea who she is. Let's talk about inflation. <laughs> Just change the topic immediately. And, yeah, and, and he obviously knows she is because she's, as you say, the mother of one of his other children so yes go on yeah so and then again it's just for the record because this gets um 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 passed over a lot in our perfervid political environment these days but just that bald face lying mm -hmm. you know which to be fair bill clinton really brought to the forefront in american politics that thing to just look into the camera and just deny something that you know is true yeah. and with with heedless of the consequences that was going to um, happen. So he, that's his playbook. So the one other great wrinkle that's happened is that it turns out that he has a son who is apparently gay. Mm -hmm. And though I guess he's a little ambiguous about it, but it turned out he's turned out he's supposedly is some big MAGA social media influencer. Very okay? big, yes. Yeah, very big. Yeah. And except just to be clear, he's very MAGA, very pro-Trump and stuff yeah. like this. But of course he's had the Herschel Walker experience up close, and he's done a devastating series of attacks on his father, saying, "Look at you, terrorized your family. We had to move six times because yeah. of you." And he said, "Literally, you were out there banging women yeah. and taking care of your kids." I'll, okay. I'll, I'll read the tweet. I'll read the tweet. I know my mum and I would really appreciate if my father Herschel Walker stopped lying and making a mockery of us. You're not a family man when you left us to bang a bunch of women, threatened to kill us and had us move over six times in six months, running from your violence. I don't care about someone who has had a bad past and takes accountability, but how dare you lie and act as though you're some moral Christian upright man. You've lived a life of destroying other people's lives. How dare you? And they recorded this video as well, which I just play just to give you a tenor of the tone of just absolute seething fury. This, as you say, Hardcore MAGA cheerleader. This is him talking about it. Family values, people. He has four kids, four different women, wasn't in the house raising one of them. He was out having sex with other women. Do you care about family values? I was silent lie after lie after lie. The abortion card drops yesterday. It's literally his handwriting in the car. They say they have receipts, whatever. He gets on Twitter. He lies about it. Okay, I'm done. Done. Yeah. It's just, you know, it's really outrageous. And then, of course, you have the whole damage of someone like the kid who is aligning himself with the party that's incredibly hostile to um, homosexual lifestyle and stuff like that. And there is this this odd thing in American life, and particularly the right, that they, um, it's, they, I don't want to say they like to, but there's a history of them sort of using damaged black candidates. You know what I mean? They mm -hmm. they prop up these people and they sort of they, who are who are african-american but who are also very very flawed and they kind of have this double reverse thing where they can um promote the you know you know herschel walker is not a good role model for african-americans in america right but here's this party that's accused of being racist saying oh look we're not racist we even have black candidates but of course the candidates they put forward are very flawed they do this with people on television and um so th there's a whole other thing there and then how his son managed to live with themselves aligning itself with those people is another mystery so there's all these levels of psychological and political damage that are going on here it's kind I, of sad. I, i'm very concerned i gotta say about his son who's to me seems super vulnerable as you say there's there's real ambiguity about his sexuality which doesn't really matter but the fact that he himself seems quite torn like he openly talks about that his attract his attraction to men but he refuses he, he he doesn't even say the word gay he refers as the g word and says how dare you say the g word about me and etc when he's just openly talking about 
his homosexual desires all the time. It's it, he's clearly a very conflicted kid who's clearly got kind of issues going on, and they're attacking him now because he stood up for himself with regards to Herschel Walker. I, I got a quote here from a GOP official that came out the day after his video that we just played. This is a deeply disturbed kid with obvious issues of his own. He's a spoiled brat and is solely to blame if Herschel loses the race. That's a GOP official saying that in the in the newspaper. Like, I really I really worry about what the what the internet is going to do, what the MAGA internet is going to do to to Christian Walker because yeah, yeah, he's a, very vulnerable. In the South, and mm. and I I want to be very delicate the way I talk about this, but. But, you know, homosexuality in the black community has always been a really big issue. And it's mm. something that is spoken about. Um, but there's there's all these books and movies and TV shows where there's this joke about the one black family member who everyone knows is gay, but no one ever talks about it. Mm. And um, and so it's a it's a very, very fraught kind of um, thing to have worked out on that level. So. Mm. Um, I, I too very much feel bad for him. Now, on the other hand, it's really interesting to see that internecine Republican warfare, which you almost never see. Mm -hmm. And the latest new, I don't know how late it was, but very recently, the Lieutenant Governor of Georgia, who's a Republican, just came out and really smacked Herschel Walker. Mm -hmm. So I gotta say, I think um, the wheels are really going to be turning against him pretty quickly. And I can see a lot of, um, I can even see some uh, um, right wing um, fundamentalist voters in Georgia actually actually turning against it, notwithstanding the, the mega tendency to double down on support for stuff like that. But this is pretty, pretty, pretty bruising. And I think I would think his campaign is toast at this point, because, again, Warnick's black. He's, a, you know, he's an incumbent. There's really not that much they can go after him for. So it doesn't look good for Walker, which, thank God, because he would be, you know, overnight, he'd be this, you know, right up there with uh, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene is, you know, the most ludicrous member of the United States. Look, I gotta say, I hope you're right, just because not from a partisan point of view, but just because I just think he just has no business being anywhere near the Senate. He is, in my view, the worst candidate I've ever seen by such a long way. Like the fact that he has complete inability to talk about any issue or policy at all. He clearly has no understanding of any of it. Um, he's a compulsive liar, as you said, and yeah, and obviously all kinds of moral issues. The fact that he's still not just lying, but I mean, because you talked about the Clintons, yeah, the Clintons have been known to lie once or twice, but they, but they, they're at least good at it. Um, like, like they're at least careful about their lies. Like he just lies in a really blatant, dogged way that just, it insults you as the viewer. It, it suggests that, that he's not even trying to accommodate anything that could be the truth uh like he's not he he's like it's it's a whole like for instance the seven the, the fact that he the fact that the woman at the center of this has kept the uh receipt of the check with a photo of the check is part of it um so with his signature on the check so there's no doubt that he signed a 700 dollar check right that that, that with the proof exists and he went on handy and he said this what about the 700 dollars check is there anybody you can remember sending that much money to well i, I send money to a lot of people and that's what's so funny and, and let's go back to my part you know I, I do scholarship for kids i give money to people all the time because i'm always helping people because i believe in being generous god has blessed me and i want to bless others and i got into this race because i'm a christian i love the lord jesus christ and i always tell everyone that no weapon formed against me shall prosper so whoever uh been out there want to lie on herschel walker you're lying on the wrong one yeah saying, saying you gave money to lots of people is not, <laughs> it's not, not like it's just such a terrible terrible defense and the thing is that there is an obvious defense that he could use. There's an obvious defense, which is that's when I was messed up and I apologize for it and I've moved on and I am now a new man. That's his whole campaign. Basically, all the things you talked about, Bill, before, he acknowledges most of them and says, without ever referring to them, he just, he just acknowledges them you know, just a general, I had a bad time back then. Yeah, and says, yeah, the line, yeah exactly. So, so this fits into that. 
if they want to, if they wanted to, but even bother, he just blatantly, brazenly lied about it and continues to. And, and actually, his response to me is actually the worst of all, worst element of all of this, which is look at this ad that he is running in response to all this. Rebel One Up's running a nasty, dishonest campaign, perfect for Washington. The Reverend doesn't even tell my full story, my true story. As everyone knows, I had a real battle with mental health. Even wrote a book about it. And by the grace of God, I've overcome it. Why not a preacher who doesn't tell the truth? He doesn't even believe in redemption. I'm Herschel Walker, saved by grace, and I approve this message. Okay, so his response is to, number one, demand forgiveness for a crime that he will not admit, he will not even say, <laughs> he will not even acknowledge, number one. And that's not how it works. If you want forgiveness, you have to confess your sins before you're forgiven. And if you truly, if you truly want to seek forgiveness. Number two, he's attacking Warnock as being a phony Christian because warnock is not accepting his redemption arc even though warnock isn't even talking about this issue like warnock's had not, has had no role to play in this issue at all this is this is walker versus an anonymous woman and the media warnock is just staying way out of it and he's trying to turn this into warnock is the phony preacher because he's not coming out and embracing me as a as part of a redemption arc for a crime that I will not even say, let alone acknowledge and confess to. It's just, and, and yeah, and it's just so shameless. It's so brazen. <laughs> it's, it's so true. And, and it reminds me again, there are so many, each of these states that we're talking about, um, there's so many interesting different moving parts, right? So in Georgia, we got to remember, Georgia, just so people remember, Georgia is a deep South state, right? Yeah. So it's right down there with Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, that kind of stuff. And so, um, and you've got two black candidates running, which again is insane, right? Mm. When when did you think that was going to happen in Georgia? Mm. Um, and so that's that's pretty interesting. Um, and and at the same time, you have people like Stacey Abrams, who nearly became a female black governor of Georgia, but ended up losing, and now is losing again this year. So you had these ebbs and flow of political power there, and the um, and so now you've got the black vote in Georgia, which is not as high as it should be, but it's formidable, looking at this guy attacking, you know, one of the successors of Martin Luther King Jr., right? Mm -hmm. And saying he's being, not being a good Christian. So that's not gonna fly at all among that community. Now, on the other hand, how the whole abortion thing is gonna play out in Georgia in these contexts is, is again, slightly difficult because Atlanta, it, which is the capital of Georgia, and I lived there for a year, is the capital of the South, right? It's the cosmopolitan intellectual capital of the South. Um, and it's growing, right? And just like all these things, you know, the suburbs are growing, suburbs are becoming more democratic, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but at the same time, you have, still have a very, very big, powerful rural um, uh, experience in Georgia, but still the demographics are always gonna be on the side of the, the Democrats in Georgia. And again, you have this guy Warnock who's already won once and is an incumbent. So, um, you know, I gotta say, it's, it's, if I had to put my money on this one, I think I would go with Warnick. What about you? I don't know. <laughs> I actually, this is where I disagree with you because I, I disagree with what you were saying before about how you think Republicans are gonna drop him. I, I don't think they are. I think they're gonna double down on him because I think it's gonna become increasingly obvious that they lose the Senate if he loses. And I think that they are going to embrace him because they have no other choice. Um, and I think that the, the black vote, I agree, is not going to love Herschel Walker's antics, but they voted, they voted in record numbers for the Dem, for Warnock, for Warnock, oh, sorry, for Walker's antics, but they voted in record numbers for Warnock last time. He needs their vote to even be competitive. So that's priced in. So if you're think, saying he loses any black voters at all. Yeah, I'm, say, I'm saying if Warnock lost any vote, black votes at all, he would lose. He needs all of them just to win, right? Warnock I'm talking about here, right? So it doesn't matter. If, if Walker got 10% of the black vote, that would be a victory for him because they got damn close to zero in the, in the, in the 2020. So, the, um, so that's, the, that, that's the first thing. I don't think black voters actually play a role in this contest at all. I think, it, I think they're priced into Warnock, right? The, uh, right. 
Yeah. But okay, can I add one thing though? Yeah, okay, yeah, so yeah. I, I would say I, there's a couple other things too. Again, just with the demographics in a state like Arizona, a state like yeah. Georgia, the demographic ground, and even in Texas, the demographics, what it may be 1% a year, three quarters of a percent, 1.5% yes. a year moving to Democrats, right? Yeah. Remember yeah. also that Warnock won not only in a special election, but in a weird, bizarre January special election. Yes. Right? So when you know so the so yes this is a midterm which generally doesn't favor the democrats mm. however it's going to be a better environment from him for him when he first got elected again he's an incumbent he gets some um he gets a little bit of a bump for that he gets a little bit of a bump from Dobbs. he gets a little bit of a bump from demographics and then of course you know and then he's running against um this guy who is shooting himself in the foot every day so um, yeah it, well, it could be worse. Let's just say it could be a lot worse. Oh, I certainly, certainly could. I certainly could. Well, it, really, Warnock should get blown out of the water in this contest. If Walker wasn't a historically bad candidate, he would be being blown out of the water because Jeff Kemp, the governor, is running for re-election in Stacey Abrams, and he's destroying her. He's absolutely smashing her at the moment. And I think that Kemp's coattails are part of what's keeping Walker in the race which actually you stole my thunder a little bit by referring to the runoff, which is actually what I think is what's going to determine this in that I think that the critical issue is going to be, this is my prediction right now, that we are very likely to have, to have Georgia be the critical race and for, the, for both candidates to get less than 50% of the vote, <laughs> which means we're going to have another runoff. That's the way it works in Georgia. In Georgia, if one candidate doesn't get 50%, you go to a runoff. Now the runoff used to be in January. In twenty in twenty twenty, they had the runoff in January. Now they've actually changed the rule because the Dem the Republicans didn't like what happened last time. So now the runoff's going to be in December, four weeks after the election. So my prediction is that we're going to have a, a second election four weeks after the midterms, with the actual with the Senate decided on the result of that election. And I think that the that that is going to how that plays is going to determine who wins the Senate. That's my prediction. I think that the yeah, because I, I think that neither is going to get fifty percent in November. Right. Okay. And I I totally hear that. I respect that. I actually would like to make a counter prediction. Which yeah, is sure. Thing I forgot. Okay. The one thing Stacey Abrams is is a great organizer yep. and a get out the vote person and stuff like yep. that. Yep. And um and I meant to add on that that when you also talk about the changing demographics of Georgia. You also have to talk about a very, very sophisticated um, uh, group in Georgia that is that is working at um, pretty that is that has been doing this now for quite a few years, right? Yeah. So I think that's the other reason I think I would give um, uh, Warnock the edge. So, yeah, I, but but maybe you're right, maybe that. But I I just kind of I just kind of feel in that race, it would just be very weird. Um, you know, the South is really changing in America and. Mm -hmm. And um, as I mentioned before, I still think the the Kirsten Cinema election <laughs> is the weirdest, most, and, and next to Trump. But yeah. when you talk about the changing demographics, I mean, speaking of someone who grew up in Arizona and I was living back there before I moved out, out to Australia, that the idea of a candidate quite as bizarre as Kirsten Cinema winning in Arizona, mm. um, you know, she won narrowly. But yeah. that is really a sign of change. Change is happening, yeah. Yeah, and, and Warnick too. You got to admit, and also Stacey Abrams nearly winning, and also Beto O'Rourke nearly beating Ted Cruz. You know, these are all really um, um, even the races where they don't win. And and you know, Abrams' time might have come and gone, but mm. um, that that these are things that oh, we're going to look back and say, oh yeah, those were the big those were the big changes in those states. Um, um, but of course, even while those states are changing, other states are evolving too. Us, you know, should. Um, Ohio now is basically a red state and things mm. like that. I look, I, I completely agree. Change is happening. I, I the uh, I, and I, I should say as well. I actually my prediction, if I had to bet my house on it, is that in that runoff in December that I'm predicting is going to happen. I think Warnock will win in the end. And the, but the reason I think he'll win is because Kemp isn't going to be on the ballot in the runoff. Kemp will have already won. It's going to be Walker staying on his own two feet against Warnock in December. And I think that there will be, I think the Republicans will still turn out en masse because it's going to be the battle for the Senate. 
but I think there'll be that critical one or two percent of Kemp voters who go, you know what? Screw this Walker guy. <laughs> like just the, and I think that the I think that Walker could get their vote in November because they're already coming out to vote for Kemp. But in the middle of winter, I think there'll be a number of people who go, you know what? I don't want to trudge through the snow to support this dickhead Herschel yeah. Walker. Okay. So okay. that's why I think over. Democrats will probably end up winning it. That's my prediction. There's not that much snow in Atlanta, number one. <laughs> okay, sure. Yeah, it's true. But um, actually, um, something you said was, oh, there, okay, now here's another thing that, that this is maybe sort of impressionable, but if you ask me that, that I, that, you know, we tend to think, oh, the governor's race is the most important race and then there's coattails. But, but I kind of think, you know, you got to remember that a lot of Americans are very apathetic and I know we have an enlivened MAGA and we have an enlivened left, et cetera, et cetera. But still, people aren't sitting around the dinner table talking about Kemp versus Abrams. I mean, they just <laughs> don't do that. You know, Americans on a good, you know, 20 years ago, they were out of it. And in the internet age with TikTok and YouTube and everything else, I mean, I bet there's just an enormous percentage of people in any of, particularly in the Sunbelt states, people who don't even know who the governor freaking is. Mm -hmm. And the Herschel Walker race is going to be the premier race in that state. So That's fair. It's, more, it's more what, um, it, you know, and, and again, he is a very, very, very polarizing person. I just kind of figured there's going to be a lot of people out voting against him. There's going to be a lot of white independent suburban people who don't want anyone like him being in the Senate. And I, um, I hope so, because he shouldn't be in the Senate. <laughs> he really shouldn't. In fact, to me, the real lesson about this, about this whole thing, is Herschel Walker is the sign that our primary system is broken. That person should never have won a primary. Like that, like just that he should never be anywhere near the Senate. He is, he actually has nothing going for him. I'm not talking about ideology here i like i don't care what his ideology is i'm saying the man cannot put a sentence together the man like he he literally can't speak he is actually like I, this sounds like a, a bit of smart assery, but i am absolutely dead serious when i say that fetterman directly after his stroke was a better speaker than walker is now in all seriousness walker just cannot put a thought together he is an, an absolute moron he cannot construct a sentence or a thought or anything. He just does not belong in the Senate at all. <laughs> and we want, and the thing is though, is we want this process to work itself out. We want the Republicans to nominate these inappropriate candidates and for them to lose. And then in theory, they start to learn. So um, on the other hand, I, I savor this because it, it, you know, we've been expecting this for so long. We thought it was gonna happen in 2016. And, um, and you know, to some extent, I mean, the right has been losing steadily ever since then. But um, you want this process to work out where they nominate these bozo candidates and the candidates lose and they're looking around and say, oh, my God, we still don't have control of the Senate. Well, why? Well, because we nominated Oz, we nominated Herschel Walker and some of these other um, substandard people. Like, yeah, we'll see. Oh, by the way, there's no polls out. You might be wondering why I'm trying to. I haven't seen any polls yet because that's the that's the, the first question. How's Walker polling since this scandal came out? There was one poll out which was an inside revenge poll, which before the scandal, it actually went across the scandal. Before the scandal broke, Walker was down by one point. After the scandal broke, he was down by three points, but that was only for like two days. So so let, let's, let, let's, we'll need to wait for a bit more polling to have some really idea. Have and we yeah. really have to see because, you know, again, people don't know what the electorate is really going to be. And the electorate has just been changing so crazily. Yeah. Um, nobody expected the turnout in Florida. Yeah. Um, so, so, you know, I'm, I'm, that's my big ambiguity thing. Like, for example, if, if the if left really did bring out a whole bunch of new registrations in the wake of the Dobbs decision, are those people going to get out and vote? Um, I think in Georgia, the get out the vote apparatus is going to be very strong, for example. And you just don't know if that's going to hold in yeah. Nevada, for example. But again, in Nevada, you got re really good union get out the vote stuff. But on the other hand, Harry Reid died. And you don't know what that sort of, I have the faintest idea what the democratic political apparatus in Nevada is doing well. In Arizona, it's pretty decayed, um, though getting stronger. So I don't know what's gonna happen in those states. And in Pennsylvania, you know, you, you know that's a state that has um, pretty strong apparatuses on both sides. So. That's true. By the way, uh, I feel like we've, we've given that a good turn now, the Senate. <laughs> Between you and me, Bill, we've worked it out. And by the way, if everything I say comes true, 
you end up with a 50-50 centered again. You end up with absolutely no movement whatsoever after all that talk. But we, we'll see. We, 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 will, we will see. Bill, do you have anything else to add uh, after this no, mammoth two-day is- podcast? <laughs> This is great. I'm always happy to do it. It gets me thinking and uh, and your your insights are always good for me too. Oh, thank you so much, Bill. I really appreciate it. But guys, as always, um, do uh, join, do uh, follow this account on Twitter, which is, uh, well, follow Bill's account. Say what that is, Bill. Um, Hitsville OZ. That's and, the one. Um, at Hitsville OZ. Yeah, and I'm also at Hitsville as well. There we go. And and my account is, well, the, the PEP account is P-E-P Chaz Dr. Dave. P-E-P-C-H-A-S-D-R-D-A-V-E. Follow that, not because of my ego, but follow that because I, I put on then when, for instance, yesterday I put on there that we were delaying this podcast by 24 hours. So you will know what's happening with the podcast. I put all the information on that Twitter feed and nothing else. No spam, nothing else, just podcast related material. So See you there. See you next time uh, when Dr. Dave will be back. Thank you. See you next time, Bill. We are definitely going to speak at the very least after the election about what's coming forward because I really want to hear your views on that. And thank you, as always, Bill. You have been tremendous and incredibly patient over a two-day time period. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Bill. Okay, bye, Chaz. Bye. Thank you.